Good evening. And welcome to the Putnam Valley Board of Education meeting of December 10th, 2020. I'd like to invite you all to join us as we salute our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And I'd also like to open with wishing everybody who's listening a happy Hanukkah, as I understand tonight is the first night. And before we do any of the other agenda, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Luff to explain the thinking and circumstances behind this meeting becoming a virtual one. Dr. Luft? So I'll start with a couple of apologies. So I apologize for the late start. Uh, we were in executive session and that ran longer. So that was why we're getting started at 7.28, not seven o'clock. Uh, and again, I apologize for the transition uh, of meetings. As many may have known, we had a positive case here in the district office. Um, we were undergoing case investigation through the Putnam County Health Department for the duration of today. Um, so at the time where we had to publicize this meeting, we were unaware of who would and would not be quarantined. Uh, therefore, it was impossible to plan to move ahead with a person in person meeting. Um, luckily, those administrators who were on this meeting avoided the quarantine list, although many of our poor colleagues did not. Um, but that just explains why this quickly became a virtual meeting as opposed to an in person meeting was just um, to provide the Department of Health time to conduct their case investigation without risk of having someone who was otherwise going to be quarantined at a public board meeting. And that's what brought us here. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I am actually having a hard time getting my board docs up. I'm having some technical difficulties, which is why being in person is always better. So, um, I was resolved to approve the minutes Please, uh, of the business meeting. Are we moving meeting. right into presentation? Uh, presentations are at to approve the minutes. So resolved to approve the minutes of the business meeting on November 12th, 2020. Second. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Ms. Furrow. And I just got it up, but now we're moving right into our first presentation. Presentation, Dr. Luft. And just so, that the treasurer's report is available for September 2020 in the business office. Thank you. So our first presentation, I know, is always one of our favorite uh, presentations of the year, where our science research students come uh, to the board meeting and uh, make their plea for mentors. It always makes me feel a little less smarter when they explain uh, what their research projects are. Um, and how in-depth and complicated they are. So in lieu of the COVID pandemic, I know that uh, Mr. Zupan had worked with his students to create a sort of a video plea, which we are going to play uh, right now for everyone. And if anyone watching uh, knows someone in the fields that these students are interested in finding a mentor for, um, I encourage you to reach out to Mr. Zupan and they love being able to make any sort of match and helping these students out through their projects. So that's it. I'll turn it over to Dan and you're gonna pop the video on. Jerry, you're on mute. Man, we can't hear it. <laughs> we can nominate someone to read Jerry's lips. Volunteers. <laughs> My name is Jerry Zubin, and I am the science research teacher here at Pine Valley High School. And we've had a very interesting year between uh, COVID 19 and 
feel all virtual, but the students have been doing amazing work so far. Uh, here we have 10 sophomores who are currently looking for mentors in the area, and each one of them is doing something different. So uh, I'd like to kind of turn it over to our sophomores who will present their topics and what kind of mentors they are looking for. And this could be anyone with research experience that could help these students in completing an experiment and or uh, getting data that they can analyze themselves in a new, interesting way. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Alexis Benedito. My topic is focused mainly on cancer epigenetics, and I'm looking into how we can use their information to develop radio immunotherapy tactics to treat the disease. I'm also interested in different areas of oncology and pharmaceutical research. This topic is important to me because cancer has still not been fully cured as they are adaptable and there are hundreds of types of them. They are extremely complex and they could defend themselves against our arsenal, which is why I would like to help in this battle. Good evening, everyone. My name is Simone Gabriel, and I'll be researching racial disparities and severe maternal morbidity. This feature is extremely important to me because I think it's imperative that we begin to lower the racial disparity in healthcare. This research is also important to me because I am pursuing a career as an OBGYN or a cardiologist. This research will allow me to continue exploring these careers. I'm looking for a mentor in New York City or the Westchester and Putnam counties. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hudson Spraza. This past year, I've been researching drug addiction in teens. This is a passion of mine because this is a growing problem in the U.S. and the world. Thank you for your time, Hudson Spraza. Hi, my name is Joan Dimitrolis. My topic is orthopedic sports medicine. I chose this topic because I have seen many people with injuries and have been injured myself plenty of times. It would be my goal to help people get back into their sport without having any long-lasting pain. I am looking for a mentor that is in the area that studies the same topic I would like to research. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hafsa Bayunis, and my topic is black holes and dark energy. This topic is important to me because these very things could be shaping the future of our universe, and yet we know almost nothing about them. I'm open to mentors from anywhere, as long as the topics they research include astrophysics, particle physics, or astronomy. Hello, my name is Sean Holzman, and my topic is growing plants on Mars. I picked this topic because I've been very interested in space. I've done some pre-research about this topic of Mars and places on Earth that are close in geographic features. I was wondering if there was any mentors that would like to help me research this topic. Thank you. Have a nice day. Good evening. My name is Sophia Gonkalvis, and I'll be researching prosthetics, specifically prosthetic research and development with bionic types of limbs. I'll be researching this because I've always been fascinated with the circuitry and inner workings of prosthetic limbs, specifically hands and upper limbs. Hello, everyone. I'm Tara Dolak, and my personal topic is on high-altitude balloons, also known as HADS. I'm very passionate about HABs because they are measuring all sorts of weather and frequency patterns in the near space part of our atmosphere. This is my mentor, Alexei Smith. Thank you and have a great day. Good evening. My name is Ava McGinty and I plan to research Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's research is important to me because more than 5 million Americans are living with it. I'm looking at the city for a mentor and I hope to find one there. Hi, my name is Rachel Berdicia, and I'll be researching the effects of animal-assisted therapy on autism spectrum disorder. This is an important topic for me because it is essential to find beneficial treatments for people who deal with the everyday challenges that it gives. I have been looking for mentors from Blue Pack Dogs and Hudson Valley Paws for Cause. Thank you. Yeah, you just heard these students are all doing amazing research. I'm so excited to see what they come up with in the next two years. And we all we already had a, another student, uh, Abigail Louder, who was actually professionally published uh, near the end of the school year last year. And we have some students who are currently also looking at getting published again this year. So again, amazing program. Thank you all for your support. And again, if anyone could possibly be a mentor or has any questions about being a mentor, please reach out to me at jzupan at pbcsd.org. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. So th thank you, Mr. Zupan. And You're right, Dr. Left. <laughs>
Um, always exciting to hear uh, the research that they're doing. And again, if anyone knows anyone in those fields that may be interested, I certainly would encourage them to reach out to Mr. Zupan and help make a match for those students. So our next two presentations will be done by Ms. Mistretta. Uh, the first one will focus on the anti-racism committee followed by a curriculum and instruction update. You're muted, Jenna, don't forget. All right, where's that? Okay, are you able to see my screen there? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about our anti-racism committee. Um, throughout the summer, there was a new created Putnam Valley anti-racism committee. Um, that committee was formed in light of recent events. Um, that we recognize the challenges educa educators face as we grapple with our responsibility to prepare our students for this diverse, ever-changing world. Um, as part of our meetings and conversations over the summer, we began to acknowledge the work that was ahead of us, and we decided to begin by um, educating ourselves as a committee. Um, the Anti-Racism Committee will be providing turnkey training for teachers on, way to, on ways to have difficult conversations with students and staff alike. Um, we know that this will be a challenging journey, but we are here to help and support each other and work together. I'll take you through this slides presentation that was is beautifully created by Lauren Soprano, who is an intern here, an administrative intern, and she is also chairing this committee. She couldn't be with us tonight because she has class, but I'm going to share her presentation. So if you could see at the bottom there, it sort of gives a little timeline of our work um, with the group gathering um, in late spring of 2020. During the summer, the larger group was formed. We worked with a consultant and we read a text together. And this fall, the, um, we sent a committee survey. We've established goals, structures of the meeting and an organizational plan. We have many members of this committee, um, which is really nice. I feel like we're very well represented, re represented in the district. So we have our building administrators, um, our board of education member, Barb Harmley, we have a um, Michelle Lucier and Jonathan Hogan, Dorothy Franz and Katie O'Dell are our elementary school representatives. Angela Metons, Jason Kane, excuse me, Lauren Soprano, Jocelyn Krauss and Keely Hartnett representing our middle school. And we have Marissa Tarkington, Julia Nelson, um, Adam Mar Ocasio, Bill, Scampoli and Susie Cummings representing our high school. Oops, let me advance. Okay. So our committee goal is to learn together to become an actively anti-racist in school district. And you can see here that these are the guiding questions that we have come up with. And these questions have really helped us to formulate our work together and to keep us um, focused on what we want to accomplish throughout this school year. So these are, uh, this is a little list here of the things that we have already accomplished um, and then our next steps. And our next steps is to meet with student groups. We actually have some high school students who would like to join our committee. And we're really um, excited to have them work with us and also some parents so that we can gain all perspectives from everyone in our community. Um, our next steps include conducting a needs analysis by surveying our faculty and our staff to improve our culture, equity, inclusion, belonging and anti-racism work along with professional development. And, um, and then planning to target our professional development curriculum work and help support the teachers with that. So 
that is my first presentation. Am I rolling into the second one? I'll just pause for a second for um, questions or comments. Uh, I'll just jump in real quick. I, I just want to recognize again um, the leadership uh, that Jeanette and Lauren Soprano have put into this um, extremely important topic and really to recognize the bravery of those uh, participants who are working on this. This is not easy stuff. It's not easy to talk about. And um, I know over the summer we had a conversation whether it was prudent to sort of soften the topic and make it more focused on equity and social justice. And the members of the committee really felt strong that this was um, the focus of the committee and they didn't want to lose sight of what they were here to do. Um, so I certainly commend them for taking their stance and keeping a focus on um, what is really um, one of the most um, important topics for us and especially our students um, these years. So thank you all. Any other questions? I'd like to come and ask a comment. Yeah, I'd like to come and I have a couple of questions. Um, one comment, I, I agree, I think calling it anti-racism just puts it out there and does not sugarcoat it in any way. So I appreciate that. Um, Jeanette, you started by saying difficult conversations. I'm on a committee in another school district that are calling them courageous conversations. And I think that um, shifts the energy a little bit. Yes, they are very difficult, um, but they're also having them are courageous and are putting it out there. And I think it's courageous for everybody on either end of the conversation. Um, so just a little, a little thought. Um, I didn't come up with it. I'm giving other people credit, but I, I think it's, a, it's just a suggestion. Um, will, will the committee members, you mentioned turnkeying, is the plan now to have these courageous conversations within the buildings? So right now we're starting the work within the committee. So we're meeting, uh, we're meeting monthly. And we are really just focusing on learning as a committee. We've all acknowledged that we are not experts in this field by any means. And so instead of us going into faculty meetings and turnkeying information that we may not be 100% assured of or comfortable with, we've really decided to sort of take a step back as a committee and learn and grow together. That's really our goal for this year and then to roll out that work this summer. And my other question is, have we explored or looked at some workshops and professional developments, even at least to start for the committee, that's outside of just your own research? I know the People's Institute does a two and a half day undoing racism training. There's a lot out there. Yes, and we, we did over the summer, we had a consultant who had come in and worked with us. I want to say she was with us for maybe four, four, four of our committee summer meetings. Um, and she was really helpful and okay. really helped to, um, to get us on the right track. I think when we first came in, our first meeting was just um, like everyone kind of sharing their thoughts and just sharing their feelings, which was a really good start to kind of get how everyone was feeling out there. And then she really helped us to sort of hone in on what our focus should be. Okay. All right. Great. So there's no other questions we get jump. And I like the idea of having, I, I just like the idea of having kids getting the next step being getting some kid voice. Um, anybody who was at that summer um, rally that were organized by three of our students, it was extremely impressive. Um, and I think um, that there is so much education needed in this area. So many um, true, um, institutional racism that goes on, but also so many unintentionally racist, aggressive things that are said every day that are not, not intentional. And the more education we do, the better, and the more we involve our students and 
and families, the better. So thank you for spearheading this work. Thank you and Lauren, and, uh, Lauren I'm sorry she couldn't be here tonight. Now I'm done. So I'm going to switch my screen here. Go over. Here we go. Okay. Are you able to see that? Is that up? Yep. Okay. So, uh, good evening. This before the summer, um, even before last summer even began, and the 2019 2020 school year was coming to an end, it really became obvious um, that the opening of the 2020 2021 school year would be very different than any other school year we have experienced in the past. And despite the challenges, the limitations and the restrictions, we were able to open all three of our schools on time with our K to four students in person every day and our grades five through 12 in a hybrid model. Um, I believe there's much to learn from the COVID-19 pandemic and the long-term effects on education. At this time, uh, there is inconsistent research on instructional and educational implications of virtual education in K-12, literature and research on hybrid, remote, uh, virtual learning in the K-12 context at this time really is, is sparse. And what we know about virtual learning pre-pandemic is based on research um, of sort of during normal times and times when parents were not forced to work at home, were not facing the stresses of and, and the fear of a, of a public health crisis, um, when families and institutions were not under financial constraints and the list, the list goes on. Um, we're learning as we go more and more every day about what works um, how to make the impossible possible, and how to best serve our students. Uh, I'm proud to present this evening on the amazing collective work of every single Putnam Valley staff member, our Board of Education, our students, our parents, our administrators, um, who have been able to safely open our schools this year. I'm gonna start by sharing some creative classroom spaces that were redesigned under the guidance and um, help and careful consideration of Dr. Luft and Mr. Spittle and our building administrators, we have been able to socially distance our students in the classrooms. And I'll just take you through a couple of these pictures that are here. Um, so this picture here is in the elementary school. This is a first grade classroom. And this is a split classroom. We have three split classes in the elementary school. We have one in first grade and we have two in fourth grade. The split classrooms are just that. It is, it's one class, but it's split into two rooms uh, where there is one teacher and one teaching assistant. So the teacher is providing the instruction and the teaching assistant is in the other room supervising the children and also supporting um, the instruction from the teacher. Interesting on certain on days when in this picture that's here, this is a um, this is when the students are receiving their art special. So you may not, I don't know if you can see, but this little face that's right here is Mrs. McCormick. And Mrs. McCormick is actually teaching art to these children who are in school, but she's across the hall in the other class. So I'm just trying to um, give a visual and explain and show exactly how our classrooms really were very carefully and creatively designed. Um, so she's instructing art to these students and the teaching assistant is also there. She's not pictured, but she's in that room. And then they sort of flip flap, flip flop back and forth. 
Um, this picture over here again shows students socially distanced. This happened to be a snapshot that I was able to take when Regent Wills was here for a visit. Uh, down here in the far left corner is our new learning commons, which I'll talk a little bit about in just a bit in the middle school. And you can see that these desks are socially distant from each other. And this has provided a space for students to have uh, lunch and spend some time for recess uh, during their lunch and recess time. And here to the lower right is a picture that I was able uh, to capture from a video in our high school band room. And you can see that our students are distant even more from each other. They're distant about 12 feet from each other, um, yet they are still able to, as they say that, you know, the, the show goes on, the music goes on. Um, and so I, you know, very thankful that we have been able to be so creative in our space and allow our students to be back in school in a safe environment. So the elementary school is open full time in all grades, kindergarten through fourth grade due to the creative efforts of the elementary school staff and the administrators. The school is almost filled to capacity, but for right now we are okay. Um, there may be a future need to look at smaller uh, number of classes, maybe one or two if students were to return to in-person learning after the new year. But at, for right now, we think that we are okay. Um, as you know, we have very young students, very young learners in our elementary school and some are coming to us in September at the age of four. And I can tell you, we are so very proud of these young learners who are wearing their masks, engaged in learning and being safe in school. September and October began with reteaching and good structured review. In November, we really saw students hitting benchmarks um, and picking up their stride. It's still necessary to reteach and to review certain areas that students are working on. However, students are working hard, they are reading and they are writing every day. Parent-teacher conferences were held on November 13th during the day and on November 19th in the evening. And all con conferences were held virtually and it went very smooth. Um, our Character Education and Diversity Committee just completed a Thanksgiving food drive and we thank all of our students for their donations. Our elementary school students continue to show good character by being kind, safe, respectful, and responsible. The elementary school character education book for the year is The Day You Begin by Jacqueline Woodson. Um, Jacqueline Woodson was actually a keynote speaker at the IB World Conference last summer, the summer prior, well, summer of 2019. Um, so many of us were able to hear her speak um, at that conference and now our elementary school is sharing her book. I'd also like to, I'd like to thank the PTA for purchasing this book for every um, elementary classroom. The Day You Begin is a beautiful picture book that celebrates diversity and connects to the literacy standards by interpreting words and phrases and looking closely at word choices and how they shape the meaning and tone of a story. Okay. So every teacher in the elementary school has created remote learning schedules um, and these plans are in place and posted on the elementary school website. So I just thought it would be important to share this. Um, if you were to go to the website right here and click on the elementary school tab, um, that would bring you to the elementary school page and right here, the daily elementary schedules in red if you were to click on this, it brings you right here to the elementary remote learning schedules. And from there, you would click on your teacher's name and that would bring you to your remote learning schedule for the day. I'd also just like to give a quick ENL update at the elementary school. Um, some of our new ENL arrivals 
are making tremendous progress this year and we're so proud of them. Um, in part due, believe it or not, to COVID and distance learning, the students are not only learning the pillars of English, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, but they're also learning some fantastic computer and technology skills. Because of Google Meets, um, and Mr. Hogan meets with several of his students through that, the teachers have been able to um, turn key, or I'm sorry, the students have been able to turn key their knowledge of technology and their understanding of computers and video uh, virtual meetings to their parents at home who previously were not as tech savvy. And so now they're able to keep more consistent communication with the school district and beyond. And um, Mr. Hogan was very proud of that. Another highlight um, from Mr. Hogan's class is the human connection that is being made in the classroom. Several of our new students who spoke no English, zero English um, before entering our school are now effectively listening and speaking in English on a consistent basis. So that's fantastic. Um, this access to English has allowed the students much more participation, not only in their ENL class, but in their home-based classrooms as well. So I wanted to share here our kindergarten parade. Oops. So kindergarten read the book, um, Elmer, which connects to the social studies curriculum. Unit one in social studies is about myself and others in kindergarten. Uh, the essential questions are about being unique and Elmer is a unique elephant. Uh, he makes everyone laugh and he is colorful while the other elephants are all gray. And in the story, Elmer tries to make himself ordinary by painting himself gray. Um, but then the other elephants didn't notice him because he wasn't being his true self. So it focuses on um, your personal identity, your sense of community and the ideas of respect and caring. This is a great um, start of the year lesson that really helps students focus on myself. Um, the students here pictured to the left, I'm sorry, pictured to the right, had a socially distant outdoor parade and they showed off their Elmer puppets. It was adorable. It was a beautiful sunny day. Um, and then the picture to the left there, just taking advantage of some real warm weather days was actually today. This was a our physical education class. And this was Mr. Heitman um, playing frosty tag with our, I believe this might've been our first graders. So it's amazing to see our youngest learners in the building um, engaging in Mandarin Chinese instruction. In our kindergarten classrooms, we have Miss Lum, who's pictured here to the left. She's teaching both in-person and remote students at the same time. So I don't know if you can see, but just behind her, um, just behind her arm is up is uh, the computer. And she has her remote students there that she's also teaching to. Uh, Miss Lum is here every day and she visits one kindergarten class per day. She has very good classroom management and has students engaged in counting, reciting greetings, learning about holidays, shapes, and symbols. In first grade, our students are building on their exposure to Mandarin language from kindergarten. First graders are expanding from their study on numbers to months and days birthdays, new songs and dances, and arts and crafts that focus on colors. Students will begin to learn soon, will begin to learn the phrase, my birthday is. Um, I would like to, to sincerely thank the Putnam Valley Education Foundation for making this Mandarin program possible for our students this year. So I'm going to talk quickly uh, about our remote learning um, in Science 21, but before I do, I'm just going to give a quick update um, from 
uh, grades one through four. So in grade one, our first graders have been building good reading habits. The students have been learning what good reading habits are and how they can use these habits when they are reading. They've been learning strategies readers use when they come across an unknown word in their just right books through shared reading and read alouds. The first graders have been building fluency and comprehension. In writing, the students have been writing small moment stories. They've been living a writerly life by writing stories about moments that happen in their lives. And they've been learning strategies to spell unknown words. The next unit, students will be learning about opinion writing. In second grade, we, um, our students are working hard to keep consistent teaching and learning going for all students and they are doing an excellent job. They are reading and writing every day with a focus on fiction reading at the, at, right, at the moment. They're learning to uh, retell beginning, middle and end with details and working on describing character emotions and traits by looking for proof within the text. In math, um, they are in the second unit adding and subtracting two and three digit numbers with and without regrouping. And they just completed a social studies unit on communities and are beginning a unit on geography. Uh, in grade three, uh, the third grade ELA unit focused on building a reading life. Students were introduced to just right books and new platforms to choose from like Raz Kids and Epic. Um, they read their first uh, class novel, Stone Fox, which is one of my favorite books, um, building on comprehension skills, summarizing, using context clues, prediction, and finding text-based evidence to support their thinking. Third grade is currently now in their nonfiction unit with a focus on exploring text features and how they can help us within our reading. Uh, they also spent time finding main idea of the text and cause and effect. In social studies, third grade is uh, beginning a unit of exploring continents and oceans and discovering landforms. The students worked on landform projects in Google Slides to help them prepare um, for the possibility of using Google Slides during any learning, remote learning situation. Um, and they, the third grade has sort of flip-flopped their units because they are um, going to be using their um, Japan unit now because they have slides ready to go from the spring. So they were able to do a flip-flop and begin that unit now. Um, in fourth grade, the, the fourth grade is right on schedule. Um, they have been studying also geography of New York State. Children created their own clay maps, including mountain ranges, rivers, lakes, oceans, and they absolutely loved that experience. Um, in the first ELA social studies module, students learned about the Haudenosaunee by annotated readings to gather better insight to their way of life. All students created wampum belts to accompany a larger piece of writing. Okay, and now um, what is featured and pictured here are two of our students. So we have Lake in the middle, who is working from home and Melania on the right, who's working from home. Um, we're very fortunate to have Ms. Bross working with our fully remote students um, at the elementary school with Science 21 instruction. She's been able to give every student an opportunity to participate in a hands-on manner um, with science at every grade level. There are more than 20 students who are remote and she at some grade levels had to break the groups into two separate classes. Um, but that was to offer more opportunity for her to stop and, and discuss the lessons that are happening. The kindergarten classes are starting their second unit which deals with forces and interactions and in particular pushes, pulls, and collisions. So this unit will culminate with the student's opportunity to create a game that includes a couple of pushes, pulls, and ultimately a collision. So I'm sure they'll have, they will have fun with that. Um, in first grade, first grade is currently working on unit two, sound and light. Second grade is working on unit one, matter and the properties of matter. 
third grade is working on their first unit, um, which is sort of a continuation of kindergarten unit on forces and interactions. Um, students have tackled the concepts of balanced and unbalanced forces, traction and friction, and are soon heading into the world of unseen forces. For our fourth graders, they are still working um, within the old Science 21 curriculum, um, but they are finishing up Unit 1, organizing in the natural world, organizing ourselves for doing science, um, and then moving into Unit 2, which will be digestion, um, nutrients, food chains, and food webs. Um, Ms. Burroughs has sent home the materials for Lake and for Melania and for all of our remote students at home. Um, and when we discuss the science uh, you know, behind the investigation, it's truly about learning to follow procedures carefully, whether verbal or written. Um, and the students are very excited to be working with her. Um, they're listening, they're following the directions that she's giving and they're excited to come to school to pick up their science materials to take home and it's, it's really working out very well. The Center for Environmental Education is a partnership that we have with BOCES. The CEE provides unique innovative programs at Putnam Valley Elementary School. The program offerings are focused on environmental teachings, science, social studies, sustainability, and team building skills. We have nine programs scheduled for this school year, including pond ecology in first grade, erosion, changing the face of the planet in second grade, family groups and butterfly study in third grade, um, and the CEE, the CEE has already completed two programs this fall. This fall, our fourth graders participated in How Beavers Built the Hudson Valley. Um, and pictured here is a kindergarten class exploring weather with my senses. While the progr programs are available virtually, we've been very fortunate to be able to run them in person at the elementary school, utilizing larger spaces such as the cafeteria and the outdoor classroom. So in taking a look at some of our iReady um, data, just, um, just some information, we do our report cards for this, we don't have a report card with grading um, for the first quarter at the elementary school. Elementary school teachers send home a narrative progress report. So in looking at quarterly grades and data, we were, um, we were fortunate to have the iReady data. So when we look at what is here, we can see that this is a comparison between iReady math data from fall of 2019 last year to um, the fall of this year. And students will be retaking iReady. And I believe the window is open. I believe Mr. Chickory told me it was the end of January is when the window opens. Um, so we will come back and we will revisit um, that data once again. Um, so this assessment in math and ELA was administered in early September. Um, the window was opened up on September 4th. So it really started right away. When we look at the data, there is somewhat of a decline, um, but it is really small um, with a, within the percentage points. Um, there's not a great difference. The achievement rate is certainly less um, than what we had expected it to be. Um, the data shows that we provided our students continued instruction through our spring closure and that our students have learned how to complete iReady with good attention to detail. Dr. Podesta and Mr. Chicory and I have reviewed this data. We're meeting with our grade level coordinators to share this and to identify the standards and the skills in which st students struggled with to target and guide our instruction. Um, and like I said, they'll be reassessed in January and that time we'll be able to really take a more accurate look at the data between our remote and our in-person students as well. Um, 
Okay, let's see. This is our reading. So you'll see when we when I talk about the middle school, I'll be able to present um, in person versus um, fully remote students. But as this assessment was given in the beginning of September, like I said, September 4th, I really didn't feel that that was valid, but it will be um, something to definitely look at when we reassess in January. Okay, our middle school. So at the middle school, we are operating under a hybrid model for grades five through eight. We are very excited to have Dr. Payne join our staff as the assistant principal at the middle school. She has made such an impact in um, her time here. Class times have been slightly shortened at the middle school to allow teachers valuable time at the end of the day for common planning and to connect with their fully remote students. The common building time is something new for middle school um, and allows for additional collaboration time within departments and grade levels. The middle school teachers have reported that they are still making up some work and are slightly behind where they were at this time last year, but are making good gains and good progress. In the good news category, our remote learners are logging onto their Google Meets on time and engaged in their synchronous instruction. Quarter one grades ended on November 13th. The report cards went out about, mm, about three weeks ago uh, through PowerSchool. Our middle school administration, our AIS teachers and our classroom teachers are always looking at multiple measures for student growth. I ready assessments were administered in ELA and math during also during the month of September. Teachers and administrators have been working collaboratively to create the Putnam Valley Middle School course catalog. Um, this is new. This comprehensive catalog will, be, will provide a wealth of information for parents and for students. Um, our Putnam Valley Middle School staff working to gather, worked very hard to gather course syllabus information in May and June of last year. Mr. McCarty and Dr. Payne worked with grade level team leaders this fall to compile this information into one document. Um, and our goal is to provide our staff, our families and our students with the opportunity to see the journey of a child from grades five through eight. Um, it's a working document and it can be updated year to year when we adapt course or for course offerings um, in taking away courses possibly and adding courses. Um, each grade level and content area focused on the standards that they teach, their themes, content and materials used. And this gives an overview of each course. And I really want to commend the middle school teachers, Mr. McCarty and Dr. Payne for their hours of work and all of the thoughtfulness that went into the creation of this document. A quick update um, before I jump to our next thing is um, just ENL at the middle school. ENL students at the middle school have started a unit on important current events, including the recent headlines about a COVID-19 vaccine and the historic election. Students were able to share their perspectives and how current events affect their lives and also discuss how we can make positive changes in our world. Um, students had very strong feelings about these topics. When discussing the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, the students were excited about it, happy that it was coming. Um, they were excited about returning to normalcy. Um, and however, they had questions about the vaccine and how it would actually work. Um, regarding the elections, the election lessons, the students were surprised that in our history, there, had, there has been no woman who has been elected to a higher office and they wanted to know more about Kamala Har um, Harris's life. And they also did not like that there was name calling in politics. Okay. Um, we are, this year we have 45 students in our grade eight algebra one with um, Mrs. Phyllis Conlon. So that number is 
um, significantly up from last year. And it's important because it really helps to set our students up for um, advanced math as they enter the high school. Uh, Mandarin instruction continues in our middle school for eighth graders. Um, this is a Chinese introductory level course designed for beginner learners who have completed seventh grade Chinese. The course aims to guide students to expand their foundation in the Chinese language. Students are guided to read and write more simplified Chinese characters. Students will continue to build communicative skills on essential topics such as self-introduction, telling times and dates, talking about hobbies, food preferences, and other common social topics. Um, Ms. Tan is our middle school Mandarin Chinese class teacher. Um, she has shared that the eighth grade students have put forth tremendous effort into her class. The class began the year by reviewing topics from last year, explored holidays and animals, and in the upcoming weeks, these students will begin to explore dates, time, and celebrate the Chinese New Year. Jeanette, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, the number, the 45 students in um, algebra, in algebra, yes. am I just, am I just mixing up two topics? Was everybody going into a math eight or is that everybody going through a science eight? And I just could have just spaced out right now. Um, it was everyone going into science eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. So pictured here are our new learning commons in the middle school. If you haven't had an opportunity to see this, you will be blown away when you come to visit our middle school and see this beautiful um, environment that's been created. We're very excited to have the learning common space open and students have been in and out of the learning commons nonstop, checking out books. It is a, truly an amazing space. Ms. Hartnett, our new library aide, has partnered with the PV Library to have high interest books brought into the Learning Commons. Students are also using the space to eat lunch, which encourages them to look through and browse books while they're in there. Uh, Mr. McCarty and Dr. Payne are working with teachers to inventory the books to see what we have and what we're able to order. Um, again, we're looking for those high interest books for our middle school students. Our new learning commons and cafeteria space will all, uh, was also um, the place where our Halloween trivia was hosted. And I wasn't able to be part of that or see it, but I heard that Dr. Payne um, ran an amazing um, Halloween trivia and there was a fun time had by all. Um, So the middle school participated in the Red Ribbon Week campaign. It was a big success. Students learned about the impact of their words and how being an upstander can help foster a positive environment for all. Grade six, seven, and eight read Ryan's story. Students pledged to grow up safe, healthy, and drug-free by understanding the dangers of drug use and abuse, respecting themselves and being drug-free and spreading the word to family and friends about the importance of being healthy and the importance of being drug-free. A beautiful display board was created and a socially distant photo booth was constructed to celebrate the week. Um, Ms. Coleman spent time in the lunchroom connecting with students where they signed the red ribbon pledge that's displayed. Um, as we look to possible planning in the future, there are discussions about incorporating red ribbon week with World Kindness Day. So picture here are some of our fifth grade students. They are participating in Science 21 and also Mystery Science lessons. Our students have been conducting experiments both in person and remotely to investigate various chemical reactions and design controlled studies. Um, in fifth grade, they are, we also are supplementing Science 21 with Mystery Science lessons. Uh, our fifth grade teachers were able to um, sort of, I guess, ex experiment with mystery science during the spring closure. And they found that it was a very helpful program um, in terms of 
supporting at home science lessons. Um, so it's something that we continue to supplement um, our, our core science program with this year. The lessons correlate with our current unit of study and they are aligned to the next generation state science standards. There's a good balance between the two programs in the hybrid model and the students are really enjoying the hands-on inquiry-based learning experience as you can obviously see here. They're, they're safe, they're wearing their masks, they're socially distanced, but they are definitely hands-on. I'm happy to share these samples with you. Um, right here, uh, we have chemical reactions. Uh, so we have students that are working with silly putty. They're asking what do fireworks, what do rubber and silly putty all have in common? Um, also within this, I believe on the right side is our Science 21 Alka-Seltzer experiment. Um, and next, I have a very short video clip um, that I am excited to share with you for two reasons. Um, it, it really shows a middle school class in action. So not only are you going to be able to see the balloon inflator lab that is part of the chemical reaction lesson, but you're also going to be able to, to take a look and see exactly what our classrooms look like right now. You will see desks that are far apart from each other. You will see, uh, you'll no longer see uh, those collaborative group tables that we normally always have. You'll see students um, obviously wearing masks. And then the camera at one point will turn and you'll be able to also see the other half of the class that is home on their virtual learning day. So we'll take a look at that. So the video is to the left. I just want to point out, and that's my favorite part of the whole presentation, that like who would have thunk <laughs> uh, back in the day that that would have been possible for teachers to be able to um, simultaneously facilitate a hands-on science lab with a group of students, half of which in person, half of which are in remote, and be able to maintain that level of engagement um, for students both at home and in school. Um, it, it would have seemed impossible to think that it would have been possible to be here um, in November when that was filmed. But I think it's just kudos to the effort and thought that our teachers have put into what was really handed them as an impossible task of simultaneously teaching students remote and in person at the same time. But after watching that, nobody can argue that those remote students feel as if they're part of that class. Now, some of those students may be in tomorrow. Some of those students never come into the classroom, but yet they're still a classroom. They're still a group. They're still peers. And they're all still learning the same way at the same time. And I think that's just a huge um, compliment to obviously the teachers in this class, but the teachers across the district for what they've been able to accomplish. And I would put our teachers and our lessons and what we've been able to accomplish so far this year up against any school district uh, when you get to see examples like that. So I just wanted to throw those my two cents out there. Yes, I, I really, I could not agree more with you. And I really commend the teachers. There's a lot of preparation work that goes into that lesson in, in the normal um, classroom setting. And so to prepare for that lesson and to make sure that their students at home have the materials, it really takes a lot of um, preparation and then a lot of classroom management. Um, but what you do see at the end is highly engaged kids who are learning and who are having fun. 
The picture that is uh, to the right is Ms. Diaz teaching a science class. And again, I, I, I wanted to share this picture because again, you can see um, this is an old, I believe this is our seventh grade students and they are uh, again, socially distant, but you can see that she is there working in front of her laptop. And she also has her remote kids um, on her screen in front of her. Uh, let's see. So the curriculum for science seven has evolved and continues to develop in order to reflect the implementation of the New York State version, New York State's version of the next generation standards. Students will learn to think like a scientist and apply scientist, scientific perspective to the world around them. Um, seventh grade science covers concepts from each of the major areas of science, biology, uh, physics, chemistry, earth science. Um, and in our eighth grade science classes, science class students uh, will continue to explore concepts from each of those four major areas of science as they did in science seven, but continue to develop scientific habits, habits of mind necessary to be critical and informed citizens. Within the major areas of science, topics will include um, things such as chemical reactions, uh, energy, space systems, uh, history of earth, human impacts, weather and climate. Um, our teachers, our middle school science teachers have really found ch some, some challenges teaching science in a hands-on inquiry-based approach with so many safety restrictions that are placed on them. But again, in the good news category, our science teachers absolutely love their content. Um, they're dedicated to their, to their students and they also love their collaboration um, and working together. So, um, our science, eight, our science eight class culminates in a mandatory New York State assessment that is currently undergoing major modifications and updates in order to be more reflective of the national level science standards. However, we, as we know, we are still awaiting guidance from NYSED on all of our state assessments. So just uh, quickly, once again, looking through data, I presented this a little bit differently. So if you look to the left side, you will see for grades five, um, all of our students and below all of our students from 2019. Now these are two separate cohorts. Um, however, this is overall grades. So we're not looking at individual students, but we're just looking at overall um, grades in all content areas in uh, which is a comparison from 2019 last year to 2020 and then on the right side you'll see the comparison there of our fifth grade students achievement from our remote fully remote students to our in-person students so what we you know in at first glance, you know, we really, it's not a significant change. There is certainly a change. Um, and we do see um, that, that the green mark there, which indicates the 85 to 100% um, is obviously smaller in the 2020 graph, but certainly not what we had anticipated. And I'll go through the grades here. So again, on the left side, this is our sixth grade comparison. On the left side, we have our um, 2020. Below that is last year's 2019. So when we compare last year, sixth grade to this year, um, very similar. And when we look to the right side, we're looking at a comparison of our remote students to our in-person students. Um, in grade seven, again, to the left, our comparison of this fall to last fall, and to the right, a comparison of our fully remote students with our in-person students. This is grade eight. 
And on the left, we have our fall 2020 compared to our fall of 2019. And to the right, we have our remote and our in-person. So for the middle school, I, I would also like to share the iReady data in reading. If you look to the left, you'll see that this was the fall data from um, 2019. And on the right, you'll see the fall data from 2020. So we certainly see, um, we see a decline and we see a change within tier one um, and tier two. However, it's, it's, it, it is not as significant as we thought that the, it would be. But nonetheless, um, you know, we ask ourselves, so, you know, what are our action steps that we take to close the learning gap? Um, I have met with our building administrators. Um, our building administrators meet weekly with teachers. Um, they have professional um, meetings to discuss and reflect on building grade level topics. At the middle school on alternate weeks, they discuss specific students to develop target ongoing support, um, targeted ongoing support, and they conduct quarterly uh, data meetings as happens as the, uh, at the elementary school as well. Um, this year at the elementary school, they, they added a data dialogue protocol to assist in making shared meaning of data and to determine next steps before and after this iReady assessment. Um, more students access accessed the fall iReady assessment, which provided increased insight into our students' present levels of performance so that we can meet students where they are. Jeanette. Yes. Now, in the pie graphs that you had up before, mm -hmm. you were comparing um, students in 2020 and 2019. You're talking about like report card grade, the yes. their grade average on the report card? Yes. Okay. So let me go back for a moment. So these here are, let me go back. So the on the left-hand side is the average of report card grades from the current end of quarter one and below that is from last year's quarter one end 2019. And then to the right is a comparison of our current students on top our fully remote students and below our in-person students, our in-person hybrid students as opposed to the fully remote students. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, I just want to confirm this is quarter versus quarter. It's not quarter versus all year. Correct. 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 This is the end of quarter one. Okay. Can you go to grade eight, please? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. In the dark blue on the right, remote. Yes. That's, okay. I can't see that percentage because my screen is, is covered. 5.3% it says for the blue, 17% for the red, 7.3 for the yellow, and 70.4 for the green. That's concerning. I mean, and the colors are changed on that on that too, yeah. so it's hard to follow. Right. Hang on one second. There we go. So the, the red, the blue is worse, <laughs> is a lower grade than the reds on grade eight remote. Right. I see that difference in color now. So that okay. So that technically, it should be. It should be different. The just as far as so everything's sequential, that blue should be red, and that red should be yellow, and that yellow should actually be the aqua. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I apologize for that. I don't know what happened here with this top one. <laughs> <laughs> just to keep us on our toes. Yeah. <laughs> Safer, really looking. <laughs> that saw it. Good job. Yeah. yeah. I will go back and fix that. Okay our high school. Um, so
So again, our high school has opened in a hybrid model for grades. Um, oh, it says five through eight. No, nope. <laughs> high school is grades nine through 12. I apologize for that. Um, to the right there, you'll see Mr. Mahoney in his, in his math class. And again, it's just another example of what our classrooms look like right now. Um, you can see the students there are socially distant. Um, SED has canceled the January 2021 administration of the Regents exams. We have not heard anything about the spring assessments. Um, again, just a reminder for anyone who is interested in helping, we are looking for those science research, seeking mentors for science research students. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about the mock interviews that took place um, with ba Mr. Baker's um, math applications class. In Mr. Baker's class, senior mock interviews were conducted last month by uh, district administrators. Uh, they, the students started by researching a position that they were interested in, a career they were interested in. Um, they had to do a lot of research. They had to find the medium income for that position in our area. Um, they had to research the entry level salary and other parts of the country to see the cost of living effect on the job of their interest. Um, they began to put together their resumes. Um, Mr. Baker showed them model resumes, gave them input from past experiences, and he even showed them some resumes and gave them samples that had typos and grammatical errors and sort of um, explained to the, to the students how to avoid the deny pile um, by having those on your resume. Once they have um, a background, they then find a format that they like for their own resume and they create one um, with their own current accomplishments. And he encourages them to, you know, keep it simple, keep it simple, but um, complete it with fields such as obviously their education experience and accomplishments. Um, lastly, they go through a very quick practice with Mr. Baker as the interviewer. And um, although we met virtually, I did this with his students last year in person. And although we met virtually this year, it, it, it still was just a wonderful experience. Um, we asked the students uh, general questions about themselves, uh, um, questions from their resumes, their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, I truly loved this experience. The students were, I felt they were very prepared. They were professional. Um, they were on time. They gave good examples for each response. Um, I, I heard Dr. Loft was pretty tough to interview with, but just saying. <laughs> um, and in Mr. Baker's class, they're now working on investments in his class. In fact, this week, they had a virtual tour of the New York Stock Exchange uh, by a friend of Mr. Baker who works there. So that's exciting. Uh, the New York uh, the New York State Seal of Biliteracy recognizes high school graduates who have attained a high level of proficiency in listening, speaking, reading, and writing in one or more languages other than English. The intent of the seal is to encourage the study of languages, identify high school graduates with language and biliteracy skills for employers, provide colleges and universities with additional information, prepare students with 21st century skills, and most importantly, recognize the value of foreign and, and native language instruction in schools and affirm the value of diversity and multilingual, in a multilingual society. This year, we have 10 Seal of Biliteracy candidates. Um, the Seal of Biliteracy testing was conducted over the past three weeks. Uh, we had the speaking section, I believe, was on December 2nd and just this past Monday, this Monday we had the writing portion conducted at the high school. So once again, we're looking forward to um, supporting our students um, throughout the rest of the year. And of course, um, being able to uh, be a guest at their presentations this spring. So, um, IB obviously has brought a lot of increased rigor to Putnam Valley High School. Um, IB continues to push our students uh, to question 
to develop deep thinking, to challenge their ideas, to be creative, to be reflective, and to be thoughtful. Um, as Dr. Andrieri has said um, to us, you know, it really truly is so remarkable um, that Putnam Valley High School offers IB for all. And every junior, every junior in our school is enrolled in an IB course. And it really makes um, Putnam Valley High School something very special. The first um, extended essay was submitted yesterday. So students are currently setting up a schedule to turn um, in their EEs, their extended essays over the next six weeks. Um, Mrs. Demain will be helping with that in the library. And then she will sit in on their final meeting and discussions with their supervisors. And then kids will go um, directly from there to write their final reflection and then upload their um, extended essays onto Manage Back. Um, Mrs. Thornton will uh, work with supervisors to have them complete their comments and predicted score and they are all uh, most likely to be done by, by the February break. On November 18th, our diploma candidates participated in core day. Core day took place for all IB diploma candidates in the library. Students were excused from their classes for the day to meet with their supervisors, seek support from Mrs. Domain and work on their core requirements. So I'm really proud um, to announce that Maria Luna has been accepted um, to this year's PR, which is our Puerto Rican Hispanic Youth Leadership Institute Phase One Regional Youth Leadership Training Program. Maria is the first Putnam Valley student selected for this leadership program. The overall purpose of the leadership program is student empowerment. Uh, to this end, the Institute has um, several goals for its student delegates, the development of leadership skills in Latino Hispanic youth, creation of opportunities for Latino Hispanic students to interact with positive role models, such as Puerto Rican Latino elected officials, educators, and business leaders, the creation of partnerships and conversations among educators, business leaders, and students, and the development of an in-depth knowledge of the state legislative process. All training sessions and Puerto Rican Hispanic Youth Leadership Institute um, training will take place virtually this year. We will be sharing um, the, the they will be sharing the log and the Zoom log information with students um, very soon. And I believe Maria has her very first training session um, coming up on this Monday, December fourteenth. So we look forward to watching Maria grow, and we're very proud of her for representing Putnam Valley. Um, ENL at the high school. We have 10 ENL students this year at the high school, four of whom are remote. Um, with the election, the ENL US history students spent a lot of time discussing many of the aspects of American government. They got real experiences with the electoral college map, researched the candidates, and even followed the New York state and local elections. Students shared with Ms. Nelson that they had follow-up conversations at home and they also talked with their families so they could learn more at home too. Ms. Nelson discusses current events um, almost in every class and the students ask a lot of really deep thought-provoking questions about what's happening and how it's being reported. U.S. history really lends itself to learning about ad advocacy and social justice. So going back to some data slides, again on the left. So um, these graphs represent the four, I'm sorry, five main departments and their totality. So this is, this is an overall of ninth through 10th grade within the math department. So you'll see the achievement rates from 2020 versus 2019 to the left and the achievement rates of our fully remote versus our in-person learners on the right-hand side. Um, this is in math.
This is our English department comparison, keeping a close eye on the colors and they seem to be correct. So this seems to be very closely aligned. Our high school science comparison. and social studies. Oh, and I think, and we also, I'm sorry, we also have world language. So again, um, this data has been shared with our building administrators. It's something that we talk about during our admin meetings. And um, it's something that our administrators work very closely with their department heads and team leaders um, to identify the learning gaps and, and to, to support all of our learners. So I'm sorry, 10% okay. of the remote learners did not pass versus in-person 4%, so 14% right. total. Are you looking here at world language? Correct. Okay. It's concerning. Okay, there it is. I, I'm not able to see the percentages. I had to minimize yeah. my, my Zoom screen. Okay. Yes, now I can see what you're talking about. Okay. So when we look here on the right hand side for all grades, all of our remote, fully remote students. Mm -hmm. It seems to be between that 85 to 100 range seems to be the same for remote and in-person, but where we see the difference is here. Mm -hmm. That's where we see the most, the most significant difference is right. I would say is within this. Jeanette, I should, I, Jeanette, um, Mistretta, I should have asked this question earlier. Um, when you have in person at the high school and the middle school, that means hybrid because exactly. we don't have anybody fully in person, correct? Yeah, exactly. So the remote are the remote, um, and we don't have general percentage or numbers are I'm just going to assume that we have from Mr. McCarty's converse, uh, presentation at our last meeting or one meeting that there are, would you say significantly more hybrid students than remote students or is it next? So in other words, these percentages reflect less kids. Correct, there's significantly less students that make up this remote category than those than the number of students that make up that in-person category. So for world languages, you're right, it, it's a much smaller sample size that's driving that 10%. It's not like a 50-50 split of students between the two. Yeah, if we see the actual numbers also that tie into this, that'd be helpful. I'm sorry, what was that? Let me share with the board the background data um, the that was used to make these charts. Thank you. I mean, I, I don't want to get into granular, but I think at some, on some level um, that the grading is even done differently this year than last year too. I mean, a lot of the grading I think is now participation as opposed to, I mean, not participation, but getting assignments in. And how much of it is assignments getting in and less uh, evaluation, and less testing? Uh, that's, a, that's a whole other can to, to or onion to peel back. But I think, um, you know, these numbers, a lot of this stuff is going to be just reflective of assignments getting in as opposed to every two weeks or every three weeks in the first quarter, there was a uh, a test of some sort because I think don't think that was really the case this year as opposed to last year. Yeah, there's definitely been some shifts in 
in the grading system between last year and this year. And, and I, I could have asked 12 questions about every slide, Jean and Jeanette, before we you completely finish. This was incredibly comprehensive and well put together. But um, in looking at this, it's the first of the remote in-person that had us kind of really noting because there wasn't that much difference. And I'm sure in all your slides, this data is driving decisions being made administratively, but can we assume that part of this issue is engagement and attendance from remote only learners versus their actual um, grasping of concepts or mastering of concepts? Yes, I certainly think that that plays a part in it. I mean, ultimately we, we want our students in school. And I think that um, you know, this data in part speaks to that, speaks to the importance of having students in school. Okay. Okay, sorry. I'm not done. <laughs> um, this is just a, a quick list of some of the professional development that has happened throughout the school year and um, continues to happen, we had a um, lot of summer offerings. Teachers um, worked together with their teams collaboratively to plan for what was a very um, unbelievable start to the school year. Um, I think that many of our teachers, um, even though they were familiar with tech tools, had to learn things literally overnight. The spring closure certainly helped um, teachers become more familiar with technology, but we have had to rely uh, on technology as an instructional tool more than ever before. Um, so we found that our teachers participated a lot in um, summer PD and um, curriculum um, revisions that would help support the start of the school year. We changed our superintendent's conference day in the beginning of the school year. We had two superintendent conference days scheduled and we um, changed that for three days for, student, for teacher preparation. We also offered teacher and parent remote learning workshops. Um, the parent remote or the parent uh, remote learning workshops focused on supporting parents through Power school device logs in device logins, uh, the Google platforms, um, and the um, the tech portal. And I have to just give a, a tremendous amount of credit to our PVCSD tech team who has answered every single call I've ever had. Even this morning, when I you know I texted Alex Goffman and Mike Lee and said, I want to run a tech, set, a tech support session for TAs today. Can we do it? And they got right back to me and said, yes, we can make it happen. Um, so our tech specialists and um, Mr. Lee have been fantastic um, support to me throughout this entire school year. Um, we had our superintendent conference day focused on technology, hybrid remote instruction. Um, we, had we have after school professional meetings. Um, all three buildings participate in our after school professional development uh, sessions. Professional development is focused on um, sharing best practices and um, collaborating with their teams planning with hybrid and remote learning. We offered video tutorials created by our tech team that covered topics um, such as Google Meet breakout rooms, uh, Google attendance, Q&A features. Um, we've had uh, teaching assistant training for our teaching assistants who are really becoming very proficient with our Google platforms and very proud of them. Uh, we did, like I said, we ran one today. We'll be running uh, two of them next week, one on Monday and one on Wednesday. And also we have individual tech support and training. So whenever um, teachers need support, they know that there is a tech specialist in their building that they can always go to for help. And we also have our teacher uh, tech support website which they can also go to and submit a help ticket if they need more support. Um, so looking ahead, 
We are continuing always our backward mapping, revising our curriculums, um, taking a look at what we can improve and what areas are um, in need of um, tweaking. Our middle school and high school math science department meetings will continue. Uh, continued learning with a focus on equity, curriculum and instructional equity, culturally responsiveness, and our anti-racism committee work. Uh, there'll be an IB presentation, which I think is very important um, for our elementary school faculty. I believe that we're trying to schedule that, I believe Dr. Podesta said around February. Um, our Innovative Classroom Academy is sort of having a, a reboot, a restart. Um, we sort of had to shut down a little bit last year after the um, uh, spring closure. Um, but what we learn as a group, we will turn key with staff. We will um, be exploring things such as sketch noting, which is a fabulous note-taking um, tech tool with more visuals. It's great for multiple learning styles, um, passion projects, diving deeper into choice boards, station teaching in a hybrid remote setting. Um, and I'm really, really excited for that. Um, also our new, we're looking forward to the new course outline in the middle school and obviously it's hard to believe, but planning for the 21-22 school year. And of course, above all, the thing that I am looking forward to is good health for all. And this is some of our art projects that some of our art teachers shared with me. Um, two pictures from the high school, and then Maria Elena shared this little lovely lady with five legs <laughs> saying thank you. Um, I do wanna just say before I close out that I had planned to present an update on our special areas, um, art, music, um, phys ed and technology, but I this became such a long presentation um, that, and I have a lot to say about the wonderful work that's happening within those departments and how truly supportive they are for our students' individual growth. So I decided to do a follow-up presentation um, just focusing on our special areas. So we'll get that on the calendar soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? For Ms. Mastretta? I could have had 12 questions on every slide. So um, I- Write them down. I mute? No, okay. I, I did and I write them all down. But uh, no, and I, you know, comments and questions, but I guess the most important thing, you know, I'm, my, it doesn't matter if you answered my questions or the slide, or the material in your slides and especially the data slides, being shared with the middle school, with the middle school, high school, and elementary school principal and staff, and driving plans and decision making, because I had a couple of questions about this and that, and I'm hoping that a principal looking at those numbers had the same question. And how are you all working together to, I mean, literally tweak the bill? Who said it last year? Build the plane as we're flying it. Um, make changes as we see what's working, what's working well, and what could be working better. That was a lot of things. <laughs> That's okay, but yes, that, that, is, that is what's happening and that is the plan. We also have, I, I do have other data points and I have other graphs that go into very specific details, um, specifically like fifth grade. I have it broken down by um, every individual content area. Um, but when we started to do the math, we realized that we would have been presenting you with close to 150 pie charts. <laughs> so we decided to just um, go with, you know, the overall grade levels and the overall departments for the high school. Um, but yes, that is ab absolutely the plan. Um, we have this information, this is valuable information, and this is what's going to help us learn more about where our students need more support and then what our next action steps will be to make sure that they have that. And I, I have one more question. The iReady assessments, yeah. um, how, I guess, for lack 
good work. How accurate or tied in are those um, to to the real, real um, achievement? And and I'll ask you. I'll tell you why I'm asking the question. Then you can probably answer it better. Of all the sides we saw, the the red flags that came up for me is the number, and it wasn't a large number, but even seven or eight students, uh, or seven percent of students in fourth grade reading two grade levels below, according to iReady. Um, you know, in, in the social emotional work, we've heard a lot that two grade levels below in third grade is how they decide, or reading, is how they decide who's gonna graduate high school and how prisons are built. So, you know, we're such a small district, we have the wonderful luxury to see 7%, which is not a large number, and flood those kids with resources. So, and I guess that's what I mean about putting, you know, together, um, you know, the, the administrators. But is I ready something that we can say, okay, those kids really are reading to grade levels below, or is it really a snapshot? Uh, well, obviously, we use multiple measures when we're looking at student achievement. Um, you know, this is just one piece that we look at, um, you know, through our RTI and student of concern meetings. This is data that is definitely presented when we discuss um, individual students of concern. Um, the iReady assessment, if you remember, it was administered right at the beginning of September. So I believe at the elementary school, the window was open September 4th and some teachers were um, having students take it right away. Um, and so in, in even a normal school year, as you know, you know there's, there, there tends to be um, the summer slide, as some people say, and um, sometimes a regression with skills and reading. Um, but certainly I think when, I think we'll have more insight when we see the, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the January iReady benchmark assessments. Okay. Yeah, I think for any tool like iReady that we're using as a universal screener that way, it's, it's used for sort of to build awareness, right? So if something stands out like, oh, we should, look at another measure to see whether or not um, what we're seeing from my okay. is in fact accurate. So it's sort of a, a, a first blush for everyone and see what we get. And then the teachers who notice students sort of pick out anomalies and then use multiple measures to identify if that's a real um, score or real concern or not. Okay. And because I feel my only comments have been to criticize or to question, um, I really loved the illustrations of how um, a, a community remote learners and in-school learners really can be. I, I think I would never have believed that. But when, when I've heard kids talk about, oh, when I saw my friend in class, they didn't see their friend in class. They saw their friend on a screen, but it was like they saw their friend in class. So that's kudos to all the teachers who are managing to do that. Yeah, and I think we have to remember as well, you know, the the, the social emotional learning that goes along. It, it really truly is woven in everything that we do. And I, I, I recall Dr. Intrieri saying that, you know, SEL is woven into everything that we are doing with students, uh, especially now. And it's, it's so true. I think students seeing their friends that they haven't seen in eight, nine months, e even on a, a computer screen or being able to join a friend in a breakout room, um, you know, it, it's really special. And I think it, it, it helps students in, in many ways, many, many more ways than we know. I agree. Okay. All right. So with that, we're going to transition to uh, our next presentation, which I'm going to show. Hold on. I'm just getting it ready. So our 
Business official is going to uh, do our next presentation. Oops, Dan, I need you to uh, flip me back to host, please, or co-host. You don't have power, Dr. West. Oh, I gave it up to Mistretta. <laughs> oh, sorry. Dan, Dan has to give it back to me, or you can. Can I, am I able to? I'm, out, I'm all set. Thanks. Okay. All right. You guys can all see that? Yep. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, before before we start um, <clears throat> going through the screen? slides, I'm sorry. Can you do full screen? Oh, yeah, sure. You, got it. you can? No, you have to do it. Oh, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think I can move it. No. Um, so, well, before we start the slides, I just want to, um, you know, preface it by uh, talking a little bit about um, our financial forecast um, in a few words about the current economic times. So, you know, listening um, to, you know, some experts from JP Morgan Chase and having meetings with other colleagues that I have, you know, I think this is a good segue into the slides. Um, you know, we've become familiar with um, what the letters PPE stand for, right? So personal protective equipment, which we all know too well, uh, we've been purchasing right and left um, to keep our students and our staff and our community safe. Um, but in the financial sense, um, PPE can also be an acronym for uh, post-pandemic economy. That's, that's what uh, we're, we're gonna be facing, right? So we haven't really reached what the post period is yet, that status, but hopefully, you know, that's on the horizon. Um, so since the beginning of this health crisis, um, we have seen like significant reductions in income, a rise in the unemployment, uh, disruptions in transportation, manufacturing, tourism, uh, different service industries that have suffered significant losses due to um, our reduction in travel, you know, restaurants, bars, entertainment, all of that um, has been affected by the quarantine measures that have been required by COVID-19. So, you know, how does this trickle down to the schools? And I think that's a, a really um, important um, topic to talk about because planning multi-year financial things at this time, um, there's so many different uncertainties. So um, how it trickles down to schools is that the economy of our states, you know, that's what drives the government to decide, you know, what are they going to be able to give schools in the form of aid? Um, so right now, you know, all of the economists are talking about, you um, believing that these disruptions really aren't going to, schools aren't really gonna be able to recover from this entirely until about 2024. So, you know, there's the lack of, um, I guess, trust amongst parents on the vaccine side, you know, how vulnerable are children, how vulnerable are the teachers. Um, you know, it's really gonna go beyond the point of the end of this year, right? So maybe learning is going to start up differently next year, but it's the financial piece of it is gonna last a while. Um, so when students do eventually return to classrooms and the, you know, they'll be, it'll be on us, right? The parents, the teachers, the administrators to confront the reality of what they've missed and other types of, you know, trauma that's evolved out of all of this um, remote, hybrid, different types of learning. So it'll probably necessitate something other than the simple, you know, restart of what school normally is. Um, we'll have families that um, could need, you know, new initiatives in learning, um, tutoring, uh, emotional support, et cetera. And of course that translates to some type of, of cost um, for all districts. And at the same time that districts will be struggling um, maybe with declining enrollment, revenue losses, either through um, like state aid, sales tax, um, you know, 
as a result of all of these different types of uh, losses to income and, and, and all these expenses. Um, so Putnam Valley, for instance, we could experience an influx of students, really. I mean, uh, it, we'll have to see, but from like the more congested areas of the state, we could uh, experience students moving in and perhaps that's gonna, um, you know, demand more services from us. Um, currently, right now, I guess their economists are saying that the, um, the economy is in a middle ground, right? It's not locked down, it's not back to normal. Uh, we're waiting for the vaccine. Um, we're um, in a place where we've rebounded partially, but not completely. So, you know, while we may expect to have the vaccine soon, you know, rolling out that even in itself is gonna take probably six months. Um, and we're not gonna experience the, um, the rebound as quickly as maybe the students will be coming back, but not the financials. Um, except on the, this week I did hear, and I, I'm sure all of you did, uh, they did roll out the vaccine in the UK. I think they had their first, uh, they gave it out uh, the first time this week and um, they're expecting to, I believe also in Canada, they've announced that uh, Pfizer has approved um, they've been approved to administer the vaccine there. So that's all, that's all good news. Um, and, you know, also the real estate market, we talked a lot about that. Um, that seemed to have stayed in um, a good place. Uh, they figured out a way to do, um, adapt to, to social distancing so that there was an allowance to buy and sell. And the shift to suburban living for a lot of people is happening, which means for us, house prices are going up, um, more homes are being built and not, you know, maybe um, in our area, there's not as much space, but they're moving up the line. They're moving from the cities and into the more suburban areas because of what's happened. So we're gonna see a lot of that growth where we are. Um, you know, businesses are spending more money on capital goods and um, things are slowly picking up. Um, and of course, we know that there's been a lot of government spending um, and it, I mean, if there wasn't for the stimulus and the unemployment offerings that they've been handing out, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to have maybe this influx in the economy uh, growing right now. Um, but there was definitely an aggressive monetary expansion by the Federal Reserve. So the interest rate stayed low. Um, we're gonna, you know, have a um, lower interest earnings on our, and our earning on our investments. But, you know, I think Overall, they're expecting it to bounce back. It's just not gonna bounce back as quickly as um, we would like it to, of course. Um, but we have to remember that any forecast that we um, were given or any is only a general direction in which we're going and it's not really finely tuned um, and everything is imperfect right now, but we're doing the best we can. So um, with that, I'm gonna start the slides and we'll just go over what um, our outlook is and um, talk about our financial planning. So, you know, we sit together, we talk about what can, uh, what can we do, right? So financial planning um, is, a, is a tough topic because in this uncertain times, you know, we need to identify, we still need to identify what our priorities are. We need to make program and financial recommendations and we need to try to build a budget around the district goals. <clears throat> you can move forward. Um, so the factors that affect our financial condition, we have organizational factors, we have environmental factors, and we have fiscal factors. So the, some examples of the organizational ones would be like our staff, staffing, our programs, our bus, bus drivers, lunch program, custodial staff, administration. Um, the environmental factors, those include like the economy, what's going on in the housing market, what's going on with enrollment. Um, the fiscal outlook would be things like, I mentioned all our revenues, our sales tax, our state aid, and um, what the tax cap is gonna end up being that feeds into our budget. You can move forward. Um, <clears throat> So the school district um, financial plan, uh, we have to think about what is our most equitable education that we can provide 
by using um, the means that we can provide it by, right? Through our revenues, the only revenues we have are, the biggest part of our revenues are our state aid, right? So, I mean, our taxes, excuse me, local taxes. Our state aid only makes up 20%. Our local taxes make up about um, 75% and a very small percentage of other types of revenues. So, you know, we have to think about where, what we can offer within the budget and meet our educational initiatives and be equitable to all students at the same time. And is the plan providing a safe and secure student learning envi environment? Like right now with COVID and campus security, when we, we things kind of get back to normal and we need the security, you know, are we, are we providing that safe place for them? A lot of that conversation has disappeared since we're dealing with other problems. Maybe that's a good thing, we'll see. Um, and does the plan provide for professional development for both teaching and support staff? And does it meet state mandates and remain under the tax cap? Because now that the New York state tax cap is in law, um, it has created a lot of limitations for the school district, right? We have to um, supplement the budgets with um, a good amount of fund balance in order to stay under that cap, but stay within our means. Another uh, big factor that the tax cap has, um, you know, uh, put upon school districts is we're seeing lower voter turnout, and lower voter turnout is is um, is not is not a good thing. I mean, we need to um, get people back to realizing that they have a voice in the school budget, um, and that's the only budget that they have a voice in. You know, the town. Um, the town budgets are not voted on, but the school district budgets are. And because of the complacency that's been, you know, it started amongst voters because of the tax cap, everyone's feeling safe, the tax cap's keeping them under, um, you know, is keeping, the law is keeping the budget under the percentage that is going to uh, make taxes go up. But that isn't always necessarily a good thing because what it's doing is eroding our fund balance and um, we have to be careful. So um, I just wanna mention that the lower voter turnout is a big deal. Um, so we move on to our next stages of planning, right? So what do we, what do we know about our budget? Uh, we need to know, what we know right now is our instructional salaries and staffing for next year. We know our healthcare costs, we know our pension costs, and what we're probably gonna need for capital infrastructure costs. And all of knowing those things helps us make those projections for our regular operating expenses. Um, but those things keep growing and that leaves less room for our general operating expenses such as materials and supplies and our um, contractual expenses. So while those other things grow and we try to stay under the cap, it squeezes the other types of expenses to a smaller amount that we're able to afford, uh, unless we're using fund balance to make those end meets, those ends meet. Um, and then we have to look at our revenues, you know, what money do we have to work with in order to make the plan come to fruition, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so we have to, um, you know, always plan for the future too. We can't just plan for the next year. We have to be thinking about the future years, right? We have to be able to predict our sustainability for programs and uh, the development of future programs. Um, identify potential shortfalls. Where are they, where are we gonna, where are we gonna lose revenue or where could we possibly lose revenue and how do we make that up? And how do we implement changes if we have to make that up? Um, can we monitor our aid projections and fund balances during the year um, that will help probably not for the next year, but maybe for some future years, because it's important to see those future years, not just look at the one year that's coming. Okay, you can keep going. Um, <clears throat> so the COVID health crisis has really changed the landscape for all school districts, um, students and all educational professionals, not just nationwide, but worldwide. And we also have to remember that our trends that we're gonna be able, that we're gonna have to look back at like this year and the year before, um, we aren't really gonna be able to factor those trends in. We're not gonna be able to see a clear picture of what our costs and our revenues were um, 
you know, unless, because there's just, there's just a, um, you know, it, it's been, it's been, it's been, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. I'm sorry. Um, you know, we've dug into our expenses and revenues in a, in a different way in these past two years that we're not gonna be able to use those two years in looking back or looking forward. So we're gonna to have to remember that. There's kind of like a, a blip in the radar, so to speak. Right, so these two years are such an anomaly, they can't be used in projecting future uh, revenues and expenses sure. because they're so different than historical and future years will be. Right. Okay, you can keep going. So in, in all of this, there's been some unintended consequences, right? So we've had some favorable and unfavorable ones. Um, and these are just the, the ones that I'm gonna highlight. I'm sure there's many more that we're gonna see. Um, and favorably, um, we've seen school closures leaving unexpended budget lines. So we've had some leftover funds from a prior year. Um, our property tax collections were not affected in the current year. Um, I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. I think that was something we expected to be affected in the current year, but it was not. Um, retirements um, that we're having um, through uh, professional, meaning the teachers, teaching staff and the non-teaching staff, they're gonna help us. They're gonna help us stabilize the budget, the salaries for the budget next year. Um, we um, had a lot of improved technology integration for content delivery. So any improvements in technology is always a plus. We've had a number of unfavorable circumstances too though. Um, and the biggest one being, and I think Jeanette just went through the slides and you saw um, what is um, not a great deal of evidence right now, but that there is what they're calling the COVID slide or a decrease in instructional time, right? So that's affecting the student outcomes. And um, economic outlook threat threatens our aid. Um, we have the shift in the focus away from development of new content and implementation of programs and, and having to work on the current content and the current technology that we need to deliver what we're doing rather than developing new content. Um, we have the cost for the PPE expenses, right? Uh, right now, I think we're up to about $300,000 in the current year. That was an unexpected and an unintended consequence of this. Um, additional staff to cover increased building needs and we've had additional technology support and equipment needed. Um, in this year. So um, I don't know when that's going away or if it's going away, but we need to plan, I think, for that, um, you know, to kind of slip into next year too. So some of the assumptions we made in the forecast, um, I, I have an allowable maximum tax levy change. I'm hoping um, that it will be able to stay under the 2% um, at 1.9. Uh, I don't know, we don't have the factors to derive that, um, you know, formula yet, but uh, soon, uh, probably around January 15th, we'll be more prepared to have that conversation. Um, the 2021 state aid has been restored. So this is my good news. This is my son coming out of the clouds that you see. Um, the Threaten, uh, the threat of uh, removing aid from the district has gone away for the current year as long as they don't change their mind in a couple of months. So last week we were notified that um, and, and given aid runs that show that our aid has been restored fully to what we had expected it to be last January. Um, I don't know what's gonna go on going forward or what's gonna go on next year. Um, health insurance rate increase, we're looking at a 1.5% increase. Um, the teacher and CSEA pension increases, where TRS's uh, teacher retirement pension system is going from 8.86% to 9.5. And that's on all salaries and earnings for, for the teachers. Uh, the other staff or employees retirement system is going from 14.6% to 16.2%. Um, and 
just to mention, that's just under the 2% that you would be allowed to add back to the tax cap, but you can't add that in because it's under 2%. So uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to find that. Uh, Social Security taxes, they're fixed at 7.65% on all salary, so we know that. And we know what our salary changes are gonna be for next year, because right now we have um, two contracts. We do have one that's uh, gonna be negotiated. It's the um, administrator's contract by the end of the year. Uh, the anticipated budget change, if um, we're targeting this correctly and uh, the tax cap comes in, um, basically how we think we were seeing it, uh, maybe a 1.45% increase over last year. Our five-year historical change um, budget to budget is 1.27%, both very, very low percentages. And um, the only way we've been able to do that is to take money from our reserves. Again, we took $2.5 million from our district reserves over the past three years to make those percentages happen. Um, and we had to make them happen or we would have exceeded the cap. So um, we needed to use $2.5 million of the district reserves. And that goes back to my earlier slide when I talked about the tax cap and how we have to use the reserves to make those ends meet. So, um, you know, it's important to stay consistent with the use of the reserves or else it can get out of control. Um, so how do we meet educational goals while maintaining fiscal solvency? Um, we have to look at our use of fund balance. We have to make sure we're not making dramatic programmatic changes that are gonna flux the budget. Um, our class sizes, our enrollment, our staff, all those things have to be looked at very carefully before we develop the budget. Uh, our change in any change in program schedules, it can, doesn't just change what the students are doing, it changes all kinds of things like lunch programs and transportation. And so renegotiating vendor contracts, um, those are the two big contracts that we have and they're both coming up this year, uh, whether we extend them or, we, or they're willing to extend them, um, we still don't know yet, but we're working on that. And again, going over maintaining adequate reserves, right? So things we need to take into consideration are possible state aid cuts next year. Uh, I mean, if they've restored it this year, it doesn't mean they're gonna continue with it next year. Um, our pension contribution rates um, could rise uh, depending on the amount of time. This is, I'm talking about future years, right? We know what they're gonna be for next year, but we don't know what they're gonna be the following year, in fact, the economic outlook is telling us that we're going to experience more of a, you know, decline in interest earnings over the next year. So those contribution rates are more than likely going to go up in the second year, more than in this first year coming up. Um, the, the economy can also have an impact on our bond ratings. So at the end of this fiscal year, the district will be bonding the project that's going on right now. Um, we, right now we're borrowing money. They're called bands, budget anticipation notes, which we've been financing and we're getting very good rates on them currently because the rates are low. But at the end of this year, we have to bond everything. So it's important that we keep our bond rating at a double A or above, um, cause that will drive what our interest rates are on those bonds. And, you know, we want to keep them as low as possible. Our debt is part of our budget that we have to pay and um, it's part of the taxpayers, you know, uh, that pay into the, uh, to the budget. Um, so new economic realities could be job market, sales tax revenue, and um, again, worldwide travel is, 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 a big, is a big deal. If, if that doesn't return to normal at the end of this, um, there, the economists are really looking at that as the driver of what is making the economy uh, dive, you know? So if we can't return to that to normal, then, you know, the country's gonna be in another place. Um, ability to, the ability to protect the taxpayer's investment in education and provide equity um, while trying to close achievement gaps, that's our, that's our goal, that's our overall arching goal, right? Is to uh, protect the money, but provide the education. And 
And uh, this kind of brings this to the end of our presentation, all right? Finding a balance to support the district's educational vision while remaining fiscally aware. You know, what's the benefit and what's the cost of what we're providing? And I ran through that kind of quickly because um, it's getting late, but I want to, we can go over it again uh, when we start um, presenting the budget in January. Um, but if anybody has any questions, I can take them or I'm always available uh, for questions, um, you know, in my office. Uh, I think if you go to the last slide, there is my email address and um, contact information for um, anybody out there that um, wants to go over any of the points that we talked about or if, if the board has any questions, we can go over them. So Jill, you're basically saying you're making we're making decisions that are important to the programming we provide our children with virtually no financial information about the future. Well, we, we know <laughs> some not knowing what's right. Yeah. We we don't know a lot of things that we need to know to um, move right. forward. I mean, we're fortunate enough to know what some of the um, larger expenses are gonna be. And I was just describing what it is that we need to know before we can start to build that budget, right? So um, we, have, um, we have a forecast um, that goes out about seven or eight years. Um, I feel that a lot of those numbers are really um, guesses at this point, um, more than I would like them to be. And I think as we move more into the budget um, presentations, we might have a better idea about um, where we stand, obviously, after we get state aid information. And we know that uh, sure. the governor is being truthful about the aid that he's giving us this year, because if the aid we are told we are getting this year is, is true, then uh, we'll be in a different place than where I thought we could have been uh, a, a very different place. I mean, Jeremy and I were talking about, you know, the possibility of losing like another two million dollars from our from our state aid, which would devastate our budget. So, um, if that doesn't happen, we're in a, in a in a very different place. So, that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank yep. you. Getting back to the meeting agenda. Sorry, I have to switch screens here. Okay, so do we, let's see. All right, so um, I don't know, they're not on the panel. I know we just met our student representatives. Are they not here this evening because we went remote? Well, at first, yeah, I do have a, a bit of a written report. At first, we, when we were meeting in person, we had given them the option to, to not intend when we were meeting in person and they had written up something. And then by the time we had switched the virtual I felt a little rushed to try to get them onto the virtual panel, but certainly something we can do uh, in the future. But uh, I do have some comments from Ms. Walsh. Uh, she did want to extend the best wishes to the individuals whose resignations will be accepted later in the meeting. Um, she speaks about a conversation she's had with IB diploma candidates and their feeling that the theory of knowledge class, uh, which is one of the requirements for the IB diploma, uh, would be an excellent elective. I think they really enjoy um, sort of the multiple perspectives uh, part of that class uh, really to sort of teach you to take a worldly view at um, complex problems and consider issues through multiple perspectives and just feeling that it was uh, a worthwhile class for um, students, not for all students, not just those within the IB program. Uh, they were looking forward to Ms. Mishreda's curriculum instruction update and said that they would be happy to 
um, sort of debrief with her afterwards and offer any uh, suggestions or feedback that they had from the report. And then they uh, she said that they're still uh, trying to find a way, the best way to get the pulse of the student body um, and explore ways to improve online learning. So that's sort of a summary of the report that she shared with us. And that's a very thoughtful and thought-filled report. So I congratulate them for, I got a sense when we met them that they really wanted to jump in being part of decision-making. And it sounds like they're on the track to doing that. So that's great. Yep. So you are next, Dr. Luft. You're lucky me. All yes. right. So I'll begin my report just by sort of summarizing. Obviously, obviously by now everyone's aware of the switch we are making to all remote instruction beginning on Monday, uh, December 14th. Um, I, I could not be more proud of this district, of all our staff um, for making it as long as we did. I know I should never admit this, but I would not have been surprised if we were closed two weeks into the school year um, with all the unknowns when we reopened. And I, again, I'm thrilled uh, how successful we have been um, in terms of the number of students we've been able to get in the building and keep in the building uh, safely. Um, the job that our teachers, teaching assistants and administrators have done to make sure that all students, both in person and remote, are receiving a high quality education, um, engaged within their learning. And again, all we speak about overcoming challenges. Um, there was brick walls laid in front of um, some of our professionals and they've been able to smash through, climb over, go around, but to do whatever was necessary to continue uh, educating our students. So that led to our um, initial conversations regarding timeline. So we know that we are closed through the holiday recess, but uh, we've had initial conversations with the board regarding the possibility of extending uh, that remote learning period beyond. Uh, I could speak a little bit of the pros and cons and I'll turn it over to the board for their comments. Obviously, even though it was an unintended closure uh, after Thanksgiving, but it became evident that that three-day closure, not, I say closure, but I really mean remote learning, um, after the Thanksgiving break benefited us as a school district. Um, there were several individuals that we were made aware of that ended up testing positive during those three days that may have otherwise been in the school buildings and, um, and exposing other individuals who would eventually been quarantined possibly forcing our buildings to close anyway. So um, that three day period of time certainly benefited us by not having everyone in there. Um, and I would imagine the scene would hold true for January. Uh, we sort of have a plan A and plan B idea. Um, if testing is available, uh, we may shift to a longer remote learning period in order to provide more time to conduct the testing. But at this time, we do not have tests made available to us from New York State. Um, so we're going to plan um, accordingly uh, without the tests, but able to pivot if we need to. So I'll open it up to the board for additional comments about um, extension of remote learning into January. OK. Does anybody want to start, or I can, or? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh Okay, so I, I just want to echo, um, you know, I, I keep joking with um, Dr. Luff that wouldn't it be nice if you got to talk about education as a superintendent and not become a public health official. And I just want to um, really acknowledge the, the constant work he and his um, staff do talking to Department of, of Health um, more than us <laughs> really being kept involved. So I, re I really do appreciate uh, that. And I think we do, um, we talked about, um, you know, individually, um, the concern with what we are being led to almost have guaranteed is a surge in potential exposure in cases as a result of the Christmas and New Year holidays. Um, 
So as of now, um, we anticipate that we will be looking at extending the remote learning for that first week after, as Dr. Love said, after um, the Christmas vacations um, to ensure that we're not doing the stop and starting, which is so disruptive to our kids' education. We, although we understand how difficult it is to um, be a working parent or even just being a parent and uh, teaching your children in their home, in your homes, we also know that it's difficult going one day one way, one day or another another way. So um, we hope that that will allow for any surges in the numbers and the infection rates to be clear so that when we do bring our children back, dare I say they're back to stay and we start talking optimistically about spring, um, less hybrid, more in-person instruction. Um, we've also talked at length about our um, staff and having staff in the building versus at home. And um, at this time, we believe that it is important that we provide staff with a safe environment. Fortunately, there have not been any cases of contracted COVID in our schools. It's the quarantining um, that has been what has occurred or the need to quarantine. And fortunately, I'm knocking on wood here, none of that quarantining has resulted in additional um, positive cases, but um, we are going to ask administration and staff to look at ways that when our students are remote only and our staff come in, that all staff have the opportunity to work in, in a space by themselves, mask free, so that they um, do what we know is the best education providing the education to children while in that learning instructional environment, but that they can do so as if they are being alone and being mass free and being able to see the faces of their students. So that was a lot. I felt like I, I, I for a minute there, I went out of my head and I just heard words come out of my mouth, almost like the Charlie Brown person. So does anybody else um, want to jump in or reiterate or underline anything that we've said? Well, I think that, first of all, you know, I'll go back to the district motto. What we want is what's best for students. That's our goal. That's always our overarching thought. What is best for students? Um, and what we believe is best for students is as much in the classroom as they can. However, this is not a safe time. We keep hearing about this whole January, this, you know, this dark period that's coming. Um, and I'm not necessarily pessimistic, but I do think it's smart to be aware. So I would agree that giving students another week home after the, the at January 4th to 8th or whatever that week is, um, would, would help them and would help the staff. Um, because the second most important part of our job is to make sure that our staff is healthy and safe. Um, and I think what Janine just said is we take that really seriously. We want to be sure that our staff is safe. We are not trying to put them in danger um, or disregard their concerns about COVID. We are not. Um, and we're trying to balance that with what we believe is best for students. So, you know, I, I agree with both Jeremy and Jeanette about, uh, Janine, about the keeping schools remote on the week of January 4th and crossing our fingers. <laughs> and, and toes. <laughs> My toes are short, they don't cross well. <laughs> And wear our masks and social distance. <laughs> oh. I just, well, I just, I, I agree with what's been said, and I just want to make sure that, that that's on record that um, 
the, the ultimate goal is to keep all safe and um, provide the excellent education that we do. So however we can do that successfully is um, in our in everyone's best interest. And I think, you know, the idea of, of not um, the goal of being re, re, rejoining in person on the 11th is just that. I don't, you know, we don't know what our numbers will be come the 6th, 7th, or 8th of January. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's not a judgment of any sort, but uh, there is going to be behaviors and accidents and issues with uh, people congregating in, around the, both holidays, the 25th, 1st, etc. And uh, just a byproduct of that is going to be uh, additional outbreaks. And you know, hopefully that the, the eighth, you know, or going through the 11th gives an opportunity for whatever is going to flow through to not necessarily burn off, but at least those people that are infected know they're infected and don't come back into a building to infect others. And if we, they know they're infected, hopefully we, you know, hopefully nobody gets infected, but if they do, uh, it, it doesn't jeopardize uh, the rest of the buildings um, at that point. So I, I think our goal <clears throat> would be to be fully in place by the 11th to return to our hybrid model and, and to our full in-person model for the elementary school, knowing full well that, you know, there's been talk of numbers being at 10% as far as uh, infection rates at that point. Um, and then who knows what um, any of the uh, the governor's regulations, of, you know, because that, that's a changing, that's a changing piece in this as far as to what the, the recommendations are going to be. So that's our goal. I think it's a, it's a attainable goal, but, you know, I, I'm no public health official as far as that is concerned. It just seems logical that we shouldn't, um, uh, we shouldn't put ourselves at risk when we know that there's going to be issues right after the first. The fourth is pretty close to the first, obviously. Uh, and I well do want to. I do want to okay. add. You know, I do hope that when we do come back in person, that we get a plan in place to get as many of our middle or high schoolers in more often, and maybe look re-examine the use of our Mondays uh, to to alternate and get uh, you know so that way students can get three days. At uh, least parts of most students can get three days a week in, uh, if we're gonna continue in the hybrid model for a little bit of the foreseeable future, I hope that that's, we're, we're looking at ways to maximize uh, that Monday or those Mondays, I should say. Okay. So it sounds like there's a, a general consensus of extending the remote learning through that first week in January. And obviously, as we always do, continue to monitor the numbers and right and always sort of have the option to extend it if needed uh, beyond that date. And I, I, the whole time we're having this conversation, Dr. Left, I keep remembering how many hours you and I spoke on the phone March 12th and then essentially March 13th and March 15th circumstances and the governor took all those conversations out of play and made, made the decisions for us. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we don't know, we don't know what, you know, January 4th is going to bring, but I think with the limited cloudy crystal ball we have, I think we're making a, a good judicious plan, giving that little extension for all students and, and for all and for staff to an extent. And allowing families to plan and teachers to plan, right. and students to plan. So okay. just to follow up on one other piece, I know we had spoken a little bit about uh, the three days that were unplanned after Thanksgiving, but providing us that flexibility or sort of that extra buffer um, because everyone was home. Is there the same willingness to mirror those days on the January side um, to sort of, even though remote instruction will resume, but to give us some flexibility, um, to give it individuals time to know whether or not they're a contact or possibly positive before returning to the building. 
I, I would say, my, I mean, I'll, I'll speak first, but I would say that, yes, um, that would be, I think, the most prudent decision to make and, and do that for that same mirror those three days that we didn't plan, but circumstances planned for us. But then just as we said about the students, um, if we have to make that, ex that extension longer than three days based on what's happening, we'll, we'll make those decisions. I mean, I think nobody is going to leave this meeting and stop thinking about what January is gonna look like. We're gonna be thinking about it virtually every day of the Christmas vacation, every day or the holiday break between now and then. So if we have to adjust, but I, I do believe that that three days is just a good, um, you know, considering the New Year's holiday is the Friday, it's just a good extra buffer that, as you said, helped us, although it was a transportation driven decision, helped us um, after Thanksgiving. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yes. I agree for January, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Well so my next piece is I wanted to provide, I know we're uh, all COVID all the time, but I wanted to provide a quick update about, uh, about for our facilities project. I can find it on my screen. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over and show a presentation, uh, just sort of giving everyone a glimpse as to the work that's being done within uh, mostly the Health and Wellness Center, but a quick update on the what's going on in the other buildings as well. So hold on one sec. All right, you guys are good? You can see that? Yep. All right. So this is just a, a rendering of what the anticipated inside of the Health and Wellness Center will look like. Um, just covering some of the work that is currently being done. Uh, anyone who drives by, they've seen uh, the masons out there. They're completing their cinder block and then they're laying brick over the top of it. So they, um, they, they are workers, uh, those masons. They're out there in the cold and the rain and the sleet and the snow. It uh, doesn't matter, but they're out there, and it's pretty amazing how quickly they've been able to uh, both put the cinder block up and now uh, do the brick facing around it. Electrical, a conduit is run, uh, the wire is being pulled to each of those locations. Plumbing, the fixtures are plumbed in, and they're working on the heating and cooling of the building. Mechanical, they're running all the HVAC ducts um, and getting the equipment ready uh, on the roof so we can heat and cool the space. The sprinkler systems have been installed and the systems are all plumbed. Uh, painting has been done on the ceiling and they're beginning to work on the walls and uh, the directors are finishing the, the structural part of the building, uh, trim and gutters, snow guards, and all that other work. Uh, future work, obviously the turf is scheduled to be delivered to the site next week. Uh, and I think late next week, they plan on start laying down the turf inside. The clear story windows will be on site and installed next week mounting the fixtures, installing the exterior doors and the garage doors, and then obviously the finishing touches, which include installing the workstations, the curtains, and the fans within that space. So this is a picture from a couple of days ago of the inside of the building. Uh, you'll see that the steel structures have been painted white to match the ceiling. Uh, you can see those black lines that go up between the steel structures. Those are the sprinkler lines, the sprinkler heads. And you'll see guys over on the side working on uh, some of the electrical that needs to be done. Here uh, is, is just sort of a, a finished part of the building. I wanted to show everyone what the brick looks like as it's finished, uh, well, almost finished. So that's uh, sort of the brick facing that's going on outside of the cinder block and it's wrapping around the entire building. Just, just showing some of the plumbing that's done, awaiting fixtures. This is gonna be a bottle filling station right here uh, at that location in the vestibule between the existing building and the new building. So picture of the outside, that blue is actually waterproofing that they spray on the cinder block before they put the insulation and the brick on. And then the structures on top of that, that's actually a storage room, the part that's blue. And on top of it is the heating and cooling units uh, that were brought up there with a crane and now are being tied into the building. 
this is a picture looking into the inside of that storage room where you can see the plumbing, the electrical work, and the mechanical installation of uh, heating and cooling, electricity, and everything else. So all the other infrastructure work within that building is all located within that storage room. And then a picture from the hill looking down uh, of the green roof and the erectors up there. They're installing the snow guards to prevent the snow from sliding off and taking people out. And um, they're quickly, after the windows are done, uh, they'll quickly be finished with their work on the actual structural part of the building. And then here's another picture of the brick facing, and this is uh, facing the wing of the science room, uh, the brick completed. Just so quick before or after slides, we've seen a glimpse of what it looked like a couple of days ago. Uh, just a quick reminder of where we came from. So the picture on the top left is like a sighting drawing. If you look down in this location right here, you'll actually see the, the making the road, right? So this is the first day they were there making the initial roadway to get up to the site. Over here, they're clearing the site, getting ready to pour some of the foundation. This is a day where the crane came and started filling some of that foundation. Right here, the walls are beginning to go up. Over here is the steel structure being erected. And then here is a picture from today, uh, looking at that front corner facing the driveway of the progress that they've made at the Health and Wellness Center. The middle school reno renovations before and after. So looking at the addition specifically, remember what it looked like beforehand, right? So this is the courtyard. This is when they were still doing asbestos abatement. When they were done with that, they dug and then they dug and then they dug some more. There's like a swamp down there somewhere. Uh, so you'll see this is actually in the courtyard. They're about 18 feet below where the courtyard was. That's how low they had to dig down to do drainage work. Um, and to pour support beams and stuff like that in there. From there, you'll see uh, the new building begin to be erected with the steel. Over here, showing it being closed in with the roof being completed and that curtain wall being installed. And then on the bottom right is a picture of where we are today. Uh, the canopy is installed, the electricity is done. We have the columns have the rock around them with over waiting for the top plates. And we're in pretty good shape in terms of the middle school work. Looking at the interior of the middle school, there was a lot of demolition being an existing space. So this first picture is showing some of the demolition. Um, I remember being here many times. This is all the trenches they had to dig to run conduit for plumbing, um, electrical work. These went down three feet. They cut right through the floor and dug down three feet to run all of their plumbing and stuff under the existing floor. Here you see them working on finishing the stage. Uh, laying the floor down for the first time. And then here is more finished looks, looking at the servery of its current state. And again, a picture of the learning commons on the interior of the building. Elementary school renovations. This was once a faculty room and there was this wall and this was once a technology office. And now this is sort of it in its current state being used as a Science 21 uh, learning lab where Ms. Bross is facilitating uh, Science 21 for the remote learners and also facilitating delivery of materials for those students who, uh, so they can pick up the materials and participate. And that's my quick overview of the construction project. Any questions about that? The famous question, when will the Health and Wellness Center be complete? You know, the truth or can I lie? You can lie. Um, <laughs> Not January 1st, right? Brave question, Jeanette. <laughs> Brave question. It'll, it'll be pretty close. Uh, they're, they're making really good progress. It's just so much easier with new construction and not finding things you didn't know were there and like, you're not taking down a wall and discovering things. Uh, so they remain pretty close. Uh, I really think the substantial completion, which is January, uh, which is uh, December 31st. I think they'll meet that substantial completion date. Um, there's a couple of things scheduled that last week that I'm not sure about. Uh, the lights are scheduled to be in on like December 23rd. That's sort of the big hanging pendant lights. So those may end up bleeding into the first week in January. 
the last thing we want to do is have the curtain installers and the fans and stuff like that put up. So that work, sort of those finishing touches may bleed into the first week in January. But as of right now, in terms of the, the systems and the core infrastructure, if the turf really arrives next week, that's going to drive the timeline because um, there's only so much you can do in there once that turf is laid down in place. So um, I'm sure it'll bleed a little bit into, into January, but I don't think it will lead to any substantial delays um, much beyond that. At least I'm certainly hopeful it does not. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, any other questions about the construction project? No. I was going to say, should I ask if we're on budget? Of course we're on budget. Okay. You ask a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, but it's always about to be on budget. Um, yeah, I do want to point out that in the spring, there will be some more uh, grading work going on in terms of the site. Uh, as they sort of work their construction equipment out, they have to peel up the item four that's there. They're going to put new topsoil down, plant grass. There's sidewalks that are going in. Uh, we have trees scheduled to come in. We've actually partnered with um, a landscape architect in town who's volunteered some services and provided design drawings to Dave and I. We've done some site walkthroughs. So we have a, a great plan in terms of plantings of different varieties in different places where they'll be successful to sort of, uh, I don't want to say hide, but sort of break up the, the landscape there. Um, we had to take down a couple of trees to build it and we had always promised to put some back. So that work won't infringe on the Health and Wellness Center opening, but will certainly, it can't be completed until um, in the springtime when the ground thaws and they can really finish that piece. So there will be some work going on there, I'm sure for the duration of the year, but in terms of getting into the health and wellness center, I'm optimistic it'll be this winter. Thank you. Welcome. So just a couple other quick notes. Um, we surveyed parents uh, regarding their experience uh, during remote instruction. This is both for hybrid and uh, for remote students. And I know I shared a summary of those results with the board. Uh, I was pleased. I thought they were overall all, uh, very optimistic. Um, they're very positive. There's certainly areas that we could work on, and we certainly I'll work with the building principals to help identify those areas and work with teachers to address them. But I was pleasantly pleased with the overall um, positive feeling that parents had uh, regarding what was going on on the distance learning side of the hybrid model. We also surveyed all of our current remote only students. Uh, we're reaching that January opt in period. Um, a vast majority of them have obviously opted to continue in remote only. I'm sure the current positivity rate is not real encouraging to those who want to send their kids back to school, although there is certainly some. I know that the principals have been working to make sure they have the necessary space within their buildings. Obviously, the elementary school is the most pressing since we have all the students already in. And I know that Dr. Podesta has been working with her grade level coordinators to help decide how to best um, spread out returning students into those classrooms where they go. And there are the possibility of needing to move a few spaces, um, the possibility of splitting a class, but really it's looking more and more optimistic that we're gonna be able to fit in those returning students within the existing classes and sections and classrooms that we currently have our students in. So um, that work will continue. A big unknown for us is how many in-person students will opt for remote. Um, that was something that we didn't anticipate becoming a big need, but as the numbers continue to worsen, it's something we are starting to see. Um, very few of the elementary school. I believe we had looked, there was five elementary school families that had opted for remote only from September through June. I'm sorry, from September through into December, but um, not to say that won't change in the future. Just a couple of school events I wanted to mention. I know Jeanette had brought this up before, but interviewing the students in Mr. Baker's class is always one of the highlights of the year. Um, it's not quite the same doing it virtually over Zoom, but again, it's, uh, it was glad to be able to do it and uh, a really good opportunity to uh, check in with students, get to know them a little better, and hopefully teach them some good life skills. The Triam Music Honor Society uh, missed their um, highly anticipated gratitude festival that I know everyone 
it looks forward to every year, um, but they have been able to produce and share a couple of virtual performances of what would have otherwise happened at the Gratitude Festival. We filmed the 50th edition of Inside Putnam Valley Schools. I was unaware during the filming that it was the 50th. Um, I would wear something silver, I think. But uh, that video is up and free for everyone to watch. That's what I got. Thank you. You are awfully busy, Dr. Left. I'll give you that. I'm happy to talk about anything not COVID related. I know. And I, we're happy to hear it. Um, so However. I'd like now. <laughs> what was that? However. <laughs> Uh, right now, um, I do want to open it up to public um, comments on, including the board, on any of the listed agenda items. And we have um, received two questions so far. Um, I will read this one. Um, Putnam Valley teacher, this is um, regarding the anti-racism presentation, uh, anti-racism anti -racism committee and presentation. Putnam Valley teachers and administrators need to be aware that their implicit biases play an integral role in teaching, engaging with, and discipline minority students. This includes both Black and Latino students. Based on my conversations with families in the district, there's a discrepancy in how students of color are disciplined and how they are engaged with compared to their white peers. This needs to be addressed, especially at the middle school. Additionally, White fragility further perpetuates stereotypes of people of color and compartmentalize them in one box. How is the anti-racism committee going to provide concrete solutions and strategies to address the above concerns? So first, that is an extremely well thought out and drafted comment and I thank you for that. Um, and one of my follow-up to the anti-racism committee was to send an email tomorrow is it possible, Dr. Luff, for Ms. Mistretta and um, Ms. Soprano to give us some aggregate data regarding, I mean, I, it's been a while since I've seen it for our district. What are our overall numbers of students in terms of students identif who identify as white, as um, Latino, as black, as indigenous, what are our numbers and what are our discipline numbers and what are our grades um, and mastery numbers? I, I think um, when we look at why this is an important issue, we need data driving the important issue. It can't just be anecdotal. Uh, and I know it's not, but I would like that part of the presentation to the board because if we do start making decisions in the future about investing some funding um, and staff development hours into this important issue, I think we need to look at what, what the exact need is as close as we can from numbers um, give us. So that's one suggestion I make if we can have, I'm sure it exists, but if we can have that data in terms of our uh, overall enrollment as well as our uh, discipline records and um, passing failing rates. And um, Ms. Mistretta may be on still and she can maybe be more clear, but at our last meeting, we talked a lot about trying to gather that data. Each of the building subcommittees, kind of like there's a subcommittee in each building, was mm -hmm. gonna work at getting some of that information as well as the questionnaire, which would ask for would help us gather data on some of the implicit and explicit biases that students and staff are seeing. Um, so we know that it needs to be data driven, not just, well, I feel like this. Um, and the committee is working on that. Okay. Yes, Barbara, I am still here. And, <laughs> and that is, <laughs> um, I just took down your your notes, Janine, um, for the student demographics, and we can certainly get that to you. And 
to Barbara's point, yes, we I, I do recall at our last meeting, we were discussing one of our future needs is conducting that um, one of our next steps is conducting that needs analysis by surveying our faculty and staff. And students. And students, yes. Okay, and the second part of that question, and, and Jeanette, you, um, Ms. Estrada, you did say that the committee is, is really in a learning process. Um, the second part was about the white fragility and how um, we there is a tendency to perpetuate stereotypes. Um, and I think when you presented, we did talk about how important getting the voice of students and families, um, particularly, you know, such as the family and, and student who submitted this comment. So do you see that that's one way to address that, to get more voice and more um, conversation among all our faculty about how our um, how we perpetuate stereotypes even when well intended not to. Sure. Yes, absolutely, and that's why I'm I'm very much looking forward to our our student representatives joining our group. But I also responded um, just a few minutes ago to this email and and okay, good and invited this individual to join our <laughs> to join our committee. So we'll see. Good plan, because clearly it's a well thought out um, response with, from someone who has a great deal of knowledge and, and passion about this subject. So that's great. Right. Good getting, getting on that, Ms. McCall. Yes, I'm hoping <laughs> for time permits, she can join us. <laughs> okay. Um, there is another question um, regarding what, what the data re, uh, about how grading was determined, about how um, that grades were based on participation versus assessment and um, what data supported that or, or how we came to that conclusion. Um, I think we just spoke, I mean, the purpose of it is I think we spoke in generality in terms of there were shifts in how grades were determined, yes, right? Okay. It's hard to make statements across all three buildings that are going to um, speak to every single teacher, every department, every grade level. Uh, but I think in general, there has certainly been across many buildings and grade levels, a shift to um, rethink how you participation grades um, are factored in. And it's not to downplay the fact that there's no um, assessments that wouldn't be true. There's certainly still yeah. formal assessments of many kinds, um, but in some ways that there certainly has been a shift in grading practices. So I think the concern is just, we don't want to make it sound like grades are only based upon participation. Right. There's certainly formal assessments that are also factored into uh, that. And I think teachers are getting more and more tech savvy um, or creative in finding ways to assess um, in-person hybrid and remote students. I would agree with that. I believe that um, when we look at the remote instruction we provided in March and April, it's light years from the remote instruction our teachers are providing now. Um, their expertise grows in this area every single solitary day. And as it gets different, assessment and grading and assignments are gonna differ. Okay. Are we ready to move on to new? Is there any other? Um, no, there are there are, there are a, there are a couple of questions. I guess more along the lines of uh, uh, safety and remote. Uh, if students are remote, uh, why are teachers not remote? And then I'll I'll defer to mostly to the document that uh, was circulated by. Uh, Dr. Luft addressing many of those questions. And if Dr. Luft, you wanna add anything else to that, um, I don't know if you wanna do that now or if you wanna deal with uh, staff stuff in a different way. Yeah, I mean, obviously I shared, uh, that question was brought up uh, from the teachers union and my response was shared in the document to the entire staff or the entire teacher staff that, I mean, I do believe uh, there are several reasons why um, teachers can more effectively teach 
um, in school in a professional environment, free from distractions, access to many resources, materials, technology, support, um, just things they wouldn't necessarily have access to at home. And it's not to uh, insinuate that there's a lack of trust that they would not do their best to teach from home. It's just uh, the sheer facts are you can't possibly mimic the materials um, and everything that comes along with your classroom and the support within the building within your own home. Um, and I think that's the desire. I think there's a recognition that there still has to be some flexibility. And I hope that um, everyone takes sort of the flexibility that's being provided the three days immediately before Christmas break and the three days immediately after as our recognition that um, when it's possible and practical and it makes sense that we're certainly willing to provide additional flexibility, but that doesn't change the overall view um, of the Board of Education that teachers are best prepared uh, to teach from their classroom and that we believe that they can safely do so. I know the next question has to do with spacing, specifically at the middle school, where teachers questioning the ability to space and not wear masks. Um, I certainly can't speak to every teacher, every period in every classroom, but I can say that we'll certainly do whatever we can to identify additional spaces where um, teachers can space out and whenever possible, teach a lesson without a mask. Um, the reality is if everybody was teaching from home, collaborative classes wouldn't be together anyway. Um, so that's not to say that a collaborative class within the building needs to be in the same location at the same time, as opposed to isolating. It's gonna mean that teachers who typically have a desk in a classroom um, and hang out at their desk while a colleague teaches the period, um, they may have to work out the deal where that person goes elsewhere for that period so their colleague can teach without a mask. Um, it's certainly going to change some of the norms, uh, practices within that building, but I'm sure the building administrators and certainly the district administration, if needed, uh, will do everything, anything we can to help identify spaces where teachers can safely teach um, from the building. Yeah, um, I was, that's exactly what I was going to say, that in the actual constraints of using your classrooms now, maybe not. But if you really look at the whole building at large, I, I can't imagine we can do that. You know, we can figure that spacing situation out. And I also want to want to say again, I, I um, Dr. Wolf just said, is the board position. I, I, it is the board position, and I do not believe we are making decisions that put our teachers at a health risk. And I don't think we would. Um, there has not been any contraction of COVID-19 in our schools to date. Uh, and we hope that that stays forever. We're making decisions based on, um, based on safety considerations. And I, I don't think we're putting our teachers at risk. And I believe we would not. Okay. Um, it looks like any other questions here are very similar to the ones we just answered. I think we were good to, to move on. Okay. Um, All right. the, the other thing is talking about the state agenda items. Um, item number seven, uh, there's going to be some conversation about, um, about the solar farm. And a lot of the community probably doesn't know about solar farms. So we'll talk about it at that point. Because actually, we need we need to talk about it because we're, the idea is that we're going to forego voting on it, but we still have comment on that time, Guy. We have comment on that because we need a second to go into questions and comments. So we can do it when whoever makes the motion. Okay. Okay. I think I'm following you. All right, number one. What order do we go in? Is it still Mr. Ferraro starts? Yes. Oh boy. I hope Great. so. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody looked at that and made that decision. I see. Okay. <laughs> That's why I left it out of seven. <laughs> I'll be, be honest. I didn't open. I didn't open it. Yeah, and I yeah. Opened it's it fine. <laughs> I'm over it. <laughs> Where is school building in New York? <laughs> Where is school buildings in New York State were permitted to reopen? in fall 2020 when statewide positivity rates were well below the 5% markers set by the governor 
if school districts have filled the COVID-19 guidance of the New York State Department of Health Education Department. Now, whereas New York State COVID-19 community positivity rates have been climbing in November 2020 and December 2020, uh, and the surveillance testing is one mechanism used to track viral spread and help maintain the health and safety of our school communities. And whereas under the governor's microcluster initiative, school-based random surveillance testing is mandated to keep school buildings open for in-person learning. And whereas public school districts have faced exceptional burdens on finances and administrative and faculty time and effort, to ensure the health, safety, and ongoing education of the young people of our state. And whereas schools and locations where community transmission rates have resulted in the designation of a microcluster zone are not set up from a financial, logistical, or regulatory perspective to take on the added burden of random surveillance testing. And whereas county departments of health are currently overwhelmed in coordinating community-wide COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas rapid antigen tests provided by the state to some school districts have been determined by public health professionals to be insufficiently accurate to permit a negative rapid test to clear individuals to re-enter school buildings, necessitating a further round of testing that might require administration by medical personnel. And whereas school districts may desire to achieve the regulatory ability to pursue surveillance testing within their schools, either as a district or working with an outside medical partner. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Putnam Valley Central School District calls upon New York State leaders to ensure that public school districts receive the financial, logistical, and regulatory support to undertake mandated board certified board approved COVID-19 surveillance testing of students, faculty and staff to ensure that school districts are not forced to keep school buildings closed due to lack of resources to ensure the safety of students and adults in school buildings. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Number two. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools that the following employees be granted tenure as teaching assistants in the Putnam Valley Central School District, effective January 23rd, 2021. Diane Mazarisi, Elizabeth Mello, Maria Roman, Myra Cintron, Don Federico, Karen Geyer, Leslie Goldfine, Melissa Lynn Keeler, Kathleen Marcisco, and Sharon Redman. Second. Questions or comments? I just want to point out, normally we would have invited them in uh, to be presented in a live meeting. Obviously, that wasn't going to work this time. So I did reach out to them and congratulate them and thank them for their many years of service and for all they do on behalf of our students and their colleagues every day. And we'll certainly welcome them, welcome them to a, another meeting when we're back in person so they can be recognized um, uh, individually. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And, and Dr. Left, I got I just got a text from a community member who said, but these people have been here so long, why are they only getting tenure now? Um, and I think just we're assuming everybody knows, but about four years ago or so, we um, shifted from having teacher aides to teacher assistants. And a number of our staff got the necessary certification. And in fact, a number of our teacher assistant on level three and have gone uh, beyond that. So that's why you see some um, faces that have been mainstays in providing support to our children for years and years, but now have been recognized for going at this different level. And I think just to jump in, um, I've known and worked with these um, fantastic TAs for years and they took such a big risk. They could have really just stayed as aides and, and not did anything and, and been just as effective, but being a TA offers our students more instructional opportunities. Um, and they have done a fantastic job. I'm so proud of them. Congratulations. Oh, we haven't voted yet. All in favor? Aye. 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 And congratulations. Um, Dr. Love, will we do, well, who knows, but possibly in the spring, we'll do our retirement tenure celebration and include 
even these people who are at a different schedule? Yeah, so I know we did, a, we had to do a virtual one last year. Uh, so we, we, we certainly could resort to the virtual uh, celebration later in the spring if necessary, but it's certainly our hope is that we'll be in person and be able to have a more formal celebration for all our tenure recipients this year. Okay, great. Moving on to number three. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve the 2021-22 budget timeline as per document number 104-21 attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? This will be up on the district website? Yes. Okay. The vote, well, the vote is on May 18th. In addition to the budget, there'll be two board seats up at that time. If you were thinking about running for the board, you have to get your petitions in to Maureen Bellino by April 19th. And you need, um, right now, I believe it's about 46 signatures. Okay. On your petition. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Number four. Resolved on recommendation of superintendent of schools to accept the resignation for the purpose of retirement from the district of teaching assistant Sharon Redman, effective June 30th, 2021, as per document 105-21, attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Actually, let me jump in one more second that this goes in keeping with um, what you had said, Dr. Luff, that hopefully in the spring, we can fully acknowledge um, all of our retirees and um, our new student rep, Ms. Walsh, um, obviously did her homework and read through the agenda and offered her congratulations to all three of these um, next agenda items, the last one and the next two. So we, of course, as a board do as well. Number five. Resolve the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to accept the resignation for the purpose of retirement from the district of the senior office assistant, Tony Posengera, uh, effective the close of business on September 3rd, 2021 is for document number 10621, attached to your agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? All right. Aye. Number six. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to accept the resignation for the purpose of retirement from the district of special education teacher Carolyn Pasquale, effective June 30th, 2021, as per document number 109-21, attached to the agenda and official minutes of the meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now moving on to the somewhat complicated number seven. So number seven is a resolution in collaboration with the town of Putnam Valley regarding the proposed Yorktown solar farm. And I make a motion to table this as per our prior conversation. Second. Questions or comments? Just as... Um... Uh, Dr. Luff mentioned a little more detail on the solar farm. This is being planned by the town of Yorktown to build, be built behind basically the high school and middle school in the property, which is now actually the town of Yorktown behind us, up by Foothill and those roads up in there. They plan to take down approximately 100 trees and build a solar farm there. And we are tabling this until we get some more information about it. So I guess related to that as a district has commissioned a uh, landscape engineer uh, to review the plans and the associated reports and to give us a written opinion on um, any potential impact that a uh, development of that solar farm and, um, and clear cutting all those trees may have on our property. So um, rather than adopting the resolution this evening, the board is gonna table it as we await um, that engineer's report um hopefully in the next few weeks additionally if uh based on the, the language here if the town has its own information and data and report 
they want to share it with us, uh, that would be uh, helpful as well. Right. When I say town, I mean Put town of Putnam Valley. Right. Okay. So we all had to approve the tabling. Yes. Did I do the all in favor part? No. No. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. I'm sorry, it's getting to be a long meeting. <laughs> um, consent agenda, moving on to number one. Resolve to approve the consent agenda items two through nine as presented to the board at this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? We're approving CSE, CPSE placements. We're approving up to eight additional work hours for three employees to attend COVID-19 meetings on policy and updates to it. And um, we're approving a one-tenth additional work for two teachers, two social studies teachers who work on the ACHIEVE courses. We're approving up to six hours for one teacher who's now doing helping with whole mount instruction for student who's in need. We're approving updates to the substitute tutor list. We're approving a stipulation of settlement agreement with an employee. We're approving an elementary school music club to put on a production, a virtual production this year. We're approving an unpaid day for an employee and a half a day unpaid for another employee. We're approving two additional bereavement days for an employee. And finally, we're approving changes to the capital project for eight contractors. These are updates based on what is going on with the actual contract. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Questions or comments? That was questions or comments, sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, moving on to our spotlight topics for upcoming meetings. Dr. Goff, do you wanna introduce these? So I know that there was uh, one on there. We had spoken a couple uh, weeks ago a couple of meetings ago about um, sort of what lens uh, history was being taught through. So I know we've had preliminary conversations with myself, Mr. Strata, uh, Dr. Injury, and I think we're gonna we're gonna look to get um, a group of individuals together, hopefully a teacher or two as well, to present to the board what our um, sort of how history is taught in Putnam Valley across all grade levels. So that was one piece that was in there, and then. Excellent. The other update was um, the beginning of our budget process. So we have a technology and our buildings and grounds department. Uh, I know they both uh, presented sort of a departmental overview earlier in, this, in the fall, but now they'll be presenting sort of budgetary implications uh, for next year. And that will kick off our budget presentations for the winter. Then I think we should probably add um... Jeanette was talking about uh, she was not able to uh, sure. have this the the ancillary uh, other academic areas in her presentation that that would be a good thing to add. Sure. So what I'll do is I'll work with Jeanette and Maureen. We'll determine which of the upcoming meetings maybe has the most space uh, to yep. fit the presentation into, and also provides Jeanette enough time to put the presentation together. But we'll certainly find a place for that over the next couple of meetings, whatever makes sense. Okay. Okay. All right. I'd like to open it up. I'll look at my email as well, but open it up for a public comment on any topic. Ms. Bellino, are you seeing anything? It looks like there was one more question from a teacher about a request to teach from home. Okay. And I can certainly respond to the e these emails uh, in writing. Um, probably not tonight after the meeting, but certainly tomorrow morning on behalf of the board. Okay. The only, the only public comment I'm going to say is that um, uh, we, we don't have another meeting till January 7th, so it's almost a full month away, and a lot right. can happen between then and now, so there might be another reason for us to have an emergency one. Um, but uh, I'm just going to wish everybody happy, healthy, and safe holidays, because we're not going to see anybody. I'm going to be request, you know, sequestered in my house <laughs> for that time. Um, but that, that was kind of, I just, that was uh, my public comment on any topic. That's a good point. 
It seems like it's so away from, far away from now, but it's really not. Two weeks. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, any other comment from anybody on the board? Then I would like to make a motion to adjourn the business meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 And, and I would like to add on behalf of all the board, my best wishes to Mr. Ferraros for a healthy, healthy, safe, happy holiday season for everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Good night, all. Take Good care. night.